Good evening, everyone. How you doing tonight? All right. Good to have you here. Uh, let's uh, call the meeting of the Santee City Council uh, to order. It's uh, February 28th, 2024, at 6.30 p.m., and let the record show that all council members are present. Uh, tonight, um, we're going to do a couple of presentations. However, before we get to that, we're going to take care of some important business. First is the uh, invocation for the night. And let me tell you a little bit about the person that's going to be here for that tonight. He is Marshall Masser, who is the lead minister at Lakeside Christian Church for the, and has been for the last 16 years. He is a preaching pastor, vision caster, staff leader, and small group teacher. Marshall completed his undergraduate work at Ozark Christian College. Ozark Christian College is in the city of Joplin, Missouri, on a 60-acre campus. The college is near Kansas City, Fayetteville, Branson, and Tulsa. The college began as the Ozark Bible College in 1942 with only 16 students. Today, with over 15,000 students and over 75 years later, the OCC continues to train men and women for Christian service. Over 90% of the graduates, that's a lot, 90% enter vocational and volunteer ministry. Marshall obtained his master's degree from Lincoln Christian University in Lincoln, Illinois. Lincoln Christian University is a Christian higher education community whose mission is to nurture and equip Christians with a Bible worldview to serve and lead in the church and the world. Marshall and his wife, Claudia, have been involved in leadership ministry for over 25 years. They have two daughters, Sydney and Linda, London. Marshall is a member of the San Diego Mountain Rescue Team. Are you still a member over there? I thought so. He loves to bike, swim, run, hike, and mountain climb. Welcome once again, Marshall. And uh, we thank you for being here. And uh, we ask that you pray for the United States of America for the great state of California, Santee, and of course the City Council, and the, uh, the uh, pre Pledge of Allegiance tonight will be led by the Mayor. Please rise for the invocation. Let's pray. Gracious God of heaven, we, we look to the mountains that surround us, and we're reminded of your majesty and your power, our greatest buildings are dwarfed by your creation. Lord, the scriptures teach us that you have made us in your image. And so we do build and plan. Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray for our state. I pray for our city. And I pray for our leaders. I pray that we will always build and plan with your nature in mind. So help these leaders to be full of mercy, to live and lead for justice, to guide us in paths that will honor you and care for the weak. And Lord, we thank you that you always do that, and we pray in your mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. Marshall. Marshall, can you come up for a second? Sorry, Mayor. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. All right. Let's see. We're going to have a proclamation tonight. Anybody here from the Little League? I don't hear anybody, must not be. Anybody here from Little League? Are you ready to come up front? Oops, wait, I have to actually come up there? Yeah, how about if you're here from the Little League, come up front here. Stand right down here and I'll be down in just a minute. Didn't mean to scare you all. Yeah. 
Freeze in there with I'll everybody wait for, else. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> I'm on with the mayor. Bunch of good looking fellas here. All right, why don't you come on, squeeze on down here a little bit, because I know there's somebody out here who wants to take some pictures. Kids, why don't you slide in front of the adults be in the back? We're a little That's taller. A great idea. Little taller. All right, well, I'll slide in the back too then. How's that sound? And we have uh, two teams here, right? Or two leagues, West Hills and uh, Santana, right? Santina. I mean, I mean, Santee. We get it, we get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was a kind of a slip up there. Yeah. I'm used to you guys fighting that out. You know? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I have two uh, proclamations here. They, they're both the same, uh, but, you know, nobody's going to be excluded. Both, uh, you know, uh, leagues here are just as important as the other until there's a winner, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. So here we go. It's a Santee proclamation. Whereas the little leagues in the city of Santee have come together to promote youth baseball for over 50 years. And whereas the city of Santee honors and celebrates our baseball athletes, both young and old, who engage in American, America's national pastime for recreation or competition. And whereas Little League believes in the power of youth baseball to teach life lessons that build stronger individuals and communities. Joined together by one common goal, encouraging friends, families, and communities to participate in the game of baseball, thus creating a sustainable enthusiasm for the game that has produced countless family and community bonding experiences. Looking over my shoulder, you want to finish? Be happy to help. Okay, all right. How am I doing so far? Okay. Thanks. And whereas the sport of baseball teaches participants teamwork, perseverance, leadership, and sportsmanship. And whereas Santee residents be benefit from participating uh, between West Hills Little League, Santee National Little League, and the city of Santee, allowing for the use of facilities such as West Hills Park and the various baseball fields used for practice and play. Now, therefore, I, John Minto, mayor of the city of Santee, on behalf of this wonderful council behind me, do hereby proclaim March 2nd, that's coming up in a couple days, right? All right. As, um, get this, Little League Day. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and along with that, we're going to encourage Santee residents to engage in activities that promote baseball for social connection, exercise, and play for all ages. All right. Who's going to accept these on behalf of each league? Okay. And what's your name, sir? Mike. Mike, congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Nathan Almada. Nathan, thank you for being here, guys. Thank now, you, um, you want to come a little bit closer. Right. Uh, we have a, an official photographer here. Any other moms or dads that want to come down here, or are you already here? Come, come on up. up. Don't You're be shy. Right. Stand right up here, anywhere you need to be, to take a picture. Oh, we didn't want you in the picture, wouldn't you? Take <laughs> Come on over here. Didn't make room for you. You're good. I'm tall. Not compared to the guy two doors down. <laughs> we good to go? All right. Go baseball. You're welcome. Thank you slighted that I just say still time, still time. Great job. 
Thanks. All right, that's the fun part of uh, this job, I have to admit. I enjoy that a lot. Uh, but let's get down to doing some uh, business here. And uh, next thing up is a uh, presentation by the East County Advanced Water Purification Joint Powers Association on the East County Advanced Water Purification <laughs> Project. Whew. It's a mouthful, I know. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the City Council. My name is Rebecca Abbott, Engineering Manager with Potter Dam Municipal Water District and the East County Advanced Water Purification Joint Powers Authority, or JPA. Um, thank you for the time this evening. I'm here to provide you with an overview and an update on the East County AWP project and a look ahead schedule with an interest in those areas where the project's construction will be visible to the community in the coming months and year ahead. What is the East County Advanced Water Purification Project all about? Why are we doing this project? The East County AWP project is a water reliability project that will create a new local, sustainable, and drought-proof drinking water supply for East County. It's about diversifying our region's water supply and reducing our reliance on imported water. This project will create up to 30% of East County's drinking water demand. The project includes construction of a new water recycling facility, solids handling facility, advanced water purification facility uh, near the site of Potter Dam's existing Ray Sawyer water recycling facility. From there, the purified water will be transported 10 miles through a 24-inch steel purified water pipeline through Fenita Parkway and Mast Boulevard through Lakeside, uh, where it will then be dechlorinated and discharged into Lake Jennings Reservoir. The project also includes sewer pump stations and sewer pipelines constructed deep underground underneath Carlton Oaks Golf Course through Santee Lakes and up Fenita Parkway uh, to the new AWP facilities. A new potable or drinking water pipeline that will serve the new facilities. And in the future, a sewer rehabilitation and installation project on Mission Gorge Road uh, west, west of the 52 and 125 interchange going all the way to the city of San Diego Mission Valley area. That project is under construction right now. Um, and construction, or I'm sorry, under design right now, and construction is at least a year out. So our staff uh, anticipates being back before the city council to give another update when we have more information about that project schedule. Um, over the course of this calendar year in 2024, we anticipate making significant progress or continuing significant progress on the construction of the purified water pipeline and the sewer pipelines in the community of Lakeside and the city of Santee. In terms of the overall project schedule, while there have been some uh, contract days awarded early on in the project to address environmental and weather challenges, related to the exceptionally wet rainy seasons and uh, nesty bird, ne excuse me, nesting birds at and near our project site, our individual project managers are managing the schedules of the components of the project effectively to minimize significant program uh, schedule impacts. So the JPA is on track to meet our funding commitments with this project. We anticipate commencing initial testing of the AWP facilities in late 2025 and begin sending water to Lake Jennings thereafter in 2026, at which time most of the construction activities across the whole project will be winding down with the exception of the future sewer rehabilitation on Mission Gorge Road West. Related to the pipeline work in Fenita Parkway and Mast Boulevard, this work is linear in nature and will be completed in segments uh, generally over the course of this year pending any weather or other schedule delays. 
You will have noticed significant pipeline installation progress on the eastern side of Mass Boulevard and on Fenita Parkway north of Lake Canyon Road. The purified water pipeline and sewer pipelines respectively have been installed in these areas as shown and the roads are base paved to allow for traffic access ahead of the final paving of those roads, which is up next for those segments. More on final paving in a moment. The contractor doing work on the purified water pipeline will continue generally east to west along Mast Boulevard and then on Finita Parkway and the Stowe Trail north of Finita Parkway in segments throughout the summer and into the fall. The contractor doing work on the sewer pipelines will simultaneously be completing pipeline installation on Finita Parkway and in Santee Lakes. While this schedule has some flexibility, it does also reflect quite a bit of coordination that the JPA is leading, not just between our project's two contractors doing the pipeline work, but also with the city's engineering and traffic engineering departments, other local agencies and community groups, outreach to residents who live near the work, and other contractors who may be doing work in and or for the city of Santee such as paving or storm drain rehabilitation. Our goal is that with all the great work being done in the city, the cumulative impacts to the residents, businesses, and traffic are minimized as much as possible. For the East County Advanced Water Purification Project, what that means is, especially in the area where the two pipeline packages are overlapping in Finita Parkway, the work is being coordinated in a way that allows each contractor space to work, completes the work as efficiently as possible, and limits the community impacts. Currently, there is active construction at the new treatment facility site near Fenita Parkway and Ganley Road in Santee Lakes and on Mass Boulevard near Kuyamaka Street. Specifically, the work uh, near Ku Kuyamaka Street is being performed now in conjunction with Padre Dam to relocate a water line ahead of the purified water pipeline construction so that the pipeline is streamlined once it reaches this busy intersection. After the pipelines are installed, paving will also be completed in segments, the limits of which will be coordinated with the city's engineering department to balance the overall cost with any roadway impacts to the community. A note about paving. On a project like this, certain activities need to be completed before a segment is ready for final paving. After the trench is dug, the pipe and valves are installed, and sometimes this requires other utilities to relocate their facilities that are in the way of the pipeline alignment. And that's actually the case on Mass Boulevard East right now. That road is base paved to allow for traffic access, but it's not in its final condition. This process helps us to ensure that all the work and any associated issues that are identified through the QAQC process are addressed before final paving so that we're not digging up a freshly paved road to get back in there and fix anything and do the final restoration twice. The JPA has a team dedicated to community outreach and program communications Public outreach is comprehensive to all the components of this project with a focus on creating awareness and preparedness throughout the community, particularly where construction activities are visible. Through the use of project signage, construction update mailers, an interactive website, web map on our website, um, and more. Our website email and phone number will be on the next slide in case the project team needs to be contacted for any reason. With that, I will say thank you again for the time and do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, questions, comments from staff? I, or, I mean, uh, council? Thank you, council. Use your microphone. Just, just good job. We, we talked at the last water board meeting, so I appreciate you bringing it forward. Thank you. Bales? 
Great, thanks. I really appreciate it. It's been a while since we've had an update. So, And I also want to make sure that everybody knows that President of the uh, Padre Municipal Water District is here, Bill Pomering in the back. So, Sorry, Bill, I forgot about you when I was making an introduction. So. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that takes us to uh, the calendar and consent calendar. Um, any items to be added, deleted, or reordered on the agenda? Ron? No. Or? No. I don't have anything. Mr. Mayor, I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to see if we can reorder number eight and nine, here nine before eight tonight, if you guys agree. Okay. So um, we would hear item number nine first. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Followed by item number eight. Is there any uh, anyone that has an issue with that? Or okay, okay. that's what we'll do. We'll reorder those items as uh, <clears throat> item number nine, followed by number eight. Anything else, Vice Mayor? Okay, uh, Rob. Nothing for me, sir. City Manager. Nothing, sir. City Attorney. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any speaker slips? None on consent, sir. Thank you. We have a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Please vote. Turn my mic on. Sorry. <laughs> Another Motion change. carries unanimously. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that takes us to non-agenda public comment. We have any speaker slips? Yes, sir. We have two speakers. First one is Gina Austin. A reminder to everybody: you have three minutes, please. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Gina Austin, and I represent um, an organization called ALCO that is the Association of Licensed Cannabis Operators. I am not speaking on item 7, don't worry. Um, and I sent you all an email with some information about the significance of intoxicating hemp and the importance of getting a ban on that either through the regulations you're adopting currently, in the near future, with some additional regulations. I took the liberty of helping Ms. Sala and provided some draft language for ordinances. If you don't know what intoxicating hemp is, it is what people have been creatively taking out of hemp, which is legal under the Farm Bill, and converting into an intoxicant. So they take the CBD, they manufacture it, and they turn it into something else. This package here of watermelon melon Skittles uh, I picked up at the smoke shop right next to Petco on my way in here. These ones I've picked up in other places. The problem with this is there's no age gating. There's no packaging requirements. There's no testing. There's nothing to keep this out of the hands of youths, nor is there any stopping from putting it and being sold in locations that are right next to schools in locations that you do not intend to allow cannabis operations. And so what we're doing in a variety of cities throughout Southern California, with a large focus here in San Diego County, is working with the local jurisdictions to help them create regulations to ban intoxicating hemp and less than until it's allowed through the regulated supply chain. This council has spent an enormous amount of time working on a very detailed ordinance to allow for cannabis operations within your city in certain limited areas with certain conditions. If you allow that to move forward without regulating this, what happens is those businesses have a very hard time of succeeding. And you have something you never intended to allow continuing to operate. So we're working with the local jurisdictions. We're working with the city of El Cajon, San Diego, Chula Vista, Lemon Grove, La Mesa, Oceanside. All of these jurisdictions have draft language. The first city that will be adopting the language, uh, hopefully, will be going to Planning Commission, which will be El Cajon in March. Uh, we also expect to be going to starting the process with a county uh, board letter coming out in the near future to direct 
the, um, an ordinance as well as uh, the city of San Diego going to public health and safety committee. So I have available, my contact information was in the e email to answer any questions you have. I encourage this council to move forward and ban this kind of stuff in your city to allow what is legal in this. Next speaker I have is Jack Sims. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Great information by the speaker there. Uh, greetings. Uh, thank you for your time this evening, City Council. Um, my name is Jack Randall Sims, two-term city commissioner in the city of Encinitas. So I'm your San Diego County uh, neighbor up to the north there. Uh, I was appointed as a commissioner in Encinitas by then Mayor, now Senator Catherine Blakespear, whom I got to know through advocating at Encinitas City Hall meetings for the creation of ordinance to provide licensure, regulation, and tax for cannabis businesses in the city. <clears throat> And city voters approved the proposed city cannabis ordinance in 2020. So you fast forward four years later, and the first legal cannabis businesses are beginning to open there, making my city a safer place and creating municipal revenue and jobs. I want to take this opportunity to thank you and to thank the citizens for welcoming cannabis businesses to Santee. There's a lot of preconceived ideas as to what that will mean for the community. Three points of fact. One, legal cannabis businesses help to keep cannabis out of the hands of those who shouldn't use it, most notably children whose brains are still forming in their teenage years. Two, legal cannabis takes the plant out of the parks and streets and puts in a legal framework which creates revenue for community improvement. And three, beyond recreational use, <clears throat> actual patients who need cannabis for important medical relief are able to get a state-tested and regulated product that's consistent with their medical needs. So speaking of these medical patients and needs, I'd like to wrap up here by uh, sharing two of many positive anecdotal experiences I've had with cannabis. The first involves a patient named Marjorie M., and she is actually a resident of your fine city of Santee. Marjorie is in her late 60s and had a surgery in 2016 for a broken hip, which left her in chronic pain. She was treating the pain with a cocktail prescription painkillers. Marjorie was recommended to a medically licensed delivery service operated by a doctor in San Diego, and we supplied her with a non-psychoactive CBD tincture. The solution had a THC concentration of about 4%, which is enough to activate the CBD, but not create any psychoactive effects. The results were palpable. She discontinued use of methadone and trimmed Vicodin intake 70%. The second antidote is personal and involves my father, who was in his mid-80s and was having trouble walking and sleeping due to severe hip and knee pain. He lives in Texas and had tried hemp-based CBD that he got at a grocery store, but it didn't do anything for the pain. He was visiting me in Encinitas in 2021, and obtained for, I obtained for him a CBD tincture that was similarly non-psychoactive with a concentration of about 3.5%. I was confident this brand would not get him high because the product is state-regulated, thoroughly tested, and 100% consistent. The results were phenomenal. His pain disappeared when he uses the tincture, combined with uh, a bomb that he uses, and he now travels out here to California regularly to purchase it for himself, to purchase it for himself. Thankfully, your citizens can access this natural medicine by just driving down the road to the city of San Diego or other cities around here. But in this case, they're putting, obviously, those tax dollars into San Diego's coffer and not the city of Santee. With this ordinance, you've now provided your citizens access to these needs in your city, to these meds in your city, while the community receives the benefit of their tax dollars, which leads to economic development in this community. Thank you for your time. Have a nice evening. Thank you. No further speakers, sir. Thank you. That takes us to item number six, which is a continued public hearing to assess community development needs and to solicit proposals for program year 2024 Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, and home program funding consistent with the consolidated plan and finding the action is not project, a project subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. Bill. Good evening, Mayor Minto, Vice Mayor Trotter, and City Council members. Next slide here. Tonight's public hearing is a continuation of the February 14th hearing, and its purpose is to allocate CDBG program funding for program year 2024. This slide shows the six applicants that were received for public services, the amounts they requested, and the amounts the applicants were allocated in the current program year. Based on our estimates of the program year 2024 allocation, $45,990 is available to allocate to these six or less applicants. The resolution included in the city council item directs staff to proportionally adjust up or down the amounts allocated tonight for the draft program year 2024 annual action plan based on the actual amount of the CDBG grant received. This adjustment would also play, uh, apply to administration and public infrastructure. 
um, allocations. This slide shows the proposed administrative activities, um, the amounts requested, and the amounts these applicants were allocated in the current year. And finally, this show, slide shows the proposed public facilities infrastructure funding, the proposed 189442 or $204,442, um, which are both estimates to be allocated towards um, program year 2024 public infrastructure, would be used for a, a future phase of the citywide ADA pedestrian ramp project. The amount allocates allocated towards the future phase of this project is dependent upon the amount awarded to the Home of Guiding Hands for their proposed concrete pathway and yard improvement uh, at their group home on Regina's Court. This concludes my report. The next step in the process would be to complete the allocation worksheets. So we will begin when you're ready. No public speakers? Council? Um, is anybody here from the Home of Guiding Hands? Can I ask you a question real quick? Please come forward. And please give us your name for the, just so we have it in the record. Good evening. Felix LaFuente, grant writer at Home of Guiding Hands. Thank you. Um, hey, Felix, I saw that you're looking for 15000 I yes. saw that there's also 8000 for other things. Mm -hmm. um, have you applied anywhere else for a grant or just those? Uh, for this Regina's Corp project, no, we have applied for other residential homes for CDBG at El Cajon and other foundations. Okay. Have you, um, I saw one bid that was kind of poorly sent to me, but I did see it. And uh, it, did, did you get other bids or did we just get one and that was it? Uh, I can acquire other bids. Okay. Well, yes. you didn't then, right? Uh, I don't have them now, no. Sorry. Okay. In the future, if you're going bring things like this forward, I would like to at least see two bids. Yes, sir. Um, I did review it, though, and it does look okay, but um, I was a little disappointed in the, in the way it was presented. So. I apologize. Nothing for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate Thank you it. very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, just as a uh, reminder... What we can do is on each one of these areas, we can go ahead and put in our numbers and agree to them. And then at the end, we will do an overall um, motion and acceptance of that. Does that work for you, uh, Sean? Yeah, that's right. So basically on each one, you'll take an interim action to approve the allocation, and then you'll do one action that approves all right. three of the allocations Perfect. together. And what we'll do is uh, we'll fill this in as we go along, and um, so uh, we'll be able to see uh, where we are for each one, and it looks like we're going to do the uh, public services activities first. Is that correct? We can start wherever you'd like. Well, we might as well go ahead and do this okay. one unless you guys want to trail it until the end. Good. All right, let's go. And uh, Vice Mayor, do you want to go first? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, 5000 for elder help. Uh, zero on the More Home project. 5000 for Meals on Wheels. 25990 for the food bank. 5000 for Santa Santa's. 5000 for Voices of Children. Okay. And um, Rob, you want to sure? <coughs> <coughs> we were only off by a thousand bucks, so um, I'm I'm actually fine with exactly what you did. We're literally off by the allocation of the nine ninety. There's so. a there's a saying that great man, minds think alike. And then there's us. I know. <laughs> or just getting lucky, yeah. Whoops. Yeah, control V, not just V. No. <laughs> I've used Excel before. Just forgot. Okay. All right. Uh, Ron? All right. Um, 5000 for elder help. I'm willing to give $1,000 for the home project. Um, Meals on Wheels, I think I have 4000 Uh 25990 I went with that on the Santee Food Bank. 
four thousand for Santee Santas and Voices of Children. I wanted to do six thousand. Whoops, that's too much. We don't have that much. <laughs> okay. Ready for me? Yes. Okay. Uh, six thousand elder help. Zero. Uh, Five thousand for Meals on Wheels. Twenty-two thousand nine hundred for Santee Food Bank. Five thousand for Santee Santas, and seven thousand for Voices for Children. Twenty-two nine ninety. Twenty-two nine nine. Twenty-two nine hundred. Oh, nine ninety. Sorry. Okay. I can't read my own writing. All right. Let me see what we have here. All right, we, uh, since we have a, a consensus uh, or a majority on elder help, I'll do 5,000 there. And we have a majority for Meals on Wheels, so I'll do the 5,000 there. We have a majority for the Santee Food Bank at 25,990, so we'll go that same there. And we have a Consensus on uh, Santee Santa's for 5000 Okay, so we have... Oh, 5000 Well, yeah, let's see. Who do I want to... Uh... Yeah, well, let's... Uh, I'm going to stay at zero on the Home, home More Project. Okay, and then we'll uh, put the five thousand on voices for children, so that will give us a consensus there for that one. And and I'll my, move my figures to match it. You mean to match the mayor's? Yeah, to match the others. Oops. That's great. Okay. All right. All right, then. So then let's go ahead and move on to the next one. We just move to approve that. Oh, okay. I'll make That's a motion. Motion to second. <clears throat> All right. Please vote. Got ahead of myself. Thanks, Counselor. Motion carries unanimously. You knew where we were going. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to this one next. All right, let's do the administrative activities. Yeah, let's go in the same order. Justin? $40,320. And $21,000. I think we're all Okay, well, let's just do that then. Is everybody uh, everyone's in, in agreement? That's agreement right. on this. I'm in agreement. Okay. Motion staff to approve. Recommendation, staff, uh, second. Uh, motion and second to approve the recommendation. Please vote. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. You want to start us off on this uh, next one? Yes, sir. Well, let's wait. You're going to do something different? Oh. Yeah, we'll go. go to public facilities. <laughs> there we go. Dustin? Um, on the good. citywide ADA pedestrian ramp, 2004, 442. Mm, 204. Rob, who's next? I'm going to go with... Okay. Pardon me. I'm going to go with 189.442 and 15,000. Ron? I actually I had 194.442, 10,000. You have 199, it's 194. One. I did that earlier. Okay. Laura? 
189,442, and 15,000. And I'm on the uh, 189442, 15,000. So that shows that uh, we uh, have a consensus. Have a consensus. Please do I have a motion, motion to approve vote? the consensus vote? Second. second. I have a motion and second. Please vote. Right. Motion carries with four eyes. You voted no on that? Thank and, you. Um, I just want to say that. Then we uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve the uh, all three items for the. I'll make the motion to approve all three items. Oh, I'll second okay. it. Thank you. Please vote. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. <coughs> and thanks for coming out, whoever came out tonight to hear on this. That takes us to item number seven, which is a public hearing and introduction and first reading of an ordinance amending chapter 7.04 of Title Seven, Public Peace, Morals, and Welfare. Case file Zebra Ocean Adam 2023-002 of the Santee Municipal Code to allow cannabis manufacturers a standalone use in the light industrial and general industrial zones and finding the ordinance is covered by the previously adopted mitigated negative declaration for the Santee Cannabis Business Ordinance pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. Mr. Mayor, I need to recuse myself from this item. Okay, thank you. Christine. If that's all it takes, we should have this more often. Exactly. So you take your time on this. Uh, we don't have to listen to Dustin. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This item is a public hearing and introduction and first reading of an ordinance amending Title Seven to allow cannabis manufacturing as a standalone use in the light industrial and general industrial zones and to prohibit the manufacturing of volatile materials. In August 2022, Council adopted the Cannabis Ordinance, and in January of this year, City Council directed staff to amend Title Seven to allow cannabis manufacturing as a standalone use in the light industrial and general industrial zones, and to prohibit the manufacturing of volatile materials. Uh, those top three sections would be revised to allow manufacturing as a standalone use and to clarify that manufacturing does not include volatile materials. Section 7.04.290 um, would be revised to add manufacturing non-volatile only to the zoning and location requirements. And section 7.04.390 would be revised to clarify the operating requirements for distributors. Staff recommends that council open and conduct the public hearing on the ordinance amending Title Seven and introduce and conduct the first reading of the ordinance and set the second reading for the ordinance for March 13, 2024. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. But before we go on to public comment, though, I do want to say that, um, or ask, this means that uh, they have to qualify in the same zones as, uh, you know, retailers, correct? They mm -hmm. can't uh, be outside or within the 900 foot. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure we get that on record. And then also, just to, uh, some people ask, uh, what kind of manufacturing would be volatile? Well, we heard earlier about um, uh, some of the hash that's being uh, um, used out there. Some people will take hash and use flammables to withdraw the cannabis, just for those who don't know, and the THC. 
and that can be very vulnerable. Those usually hear about those things blowing up houses and stuff. They use butane or other types of uh, fluid in order to do that. So just so people know that we are going to make sure that we do not have any of that being used in our city. So let's go to um, speaker slips. First speaker is Gina Austin. Welcome back. <laughs> Once again, my name is Gina Austin. Uh, I commend the city for really a lot of hard work on this ordinance. Um, two pieces of information that you may not be aware of. Uh, distribution is being prohibited unless it's part of a micro-business. A micro-business under state law requires three uses. That means that you couldn't have distribution, you couldn't self-distribute as a manufacturer you can be a manufacturer, but you've got to go hire somebody else to distribute that. That may not be what you want long term, obviously not something you probably want to deal with right this moment. Note that the city of San Diego has 20 available manufacturing production facility licenses available today that somebody could go in for. So there's not a high demand for it. And if you don't allow distribution, you may be allowing this for not, just to let you know. The second comment uh, relates to actually back to my public comment, which I didn't think I was going to be able to speak on here. But on section 7.04.100, maximum number of types of licenses, there's an added section for clarification purposes, which says all other cannabis uses are prohibited. Because cannabis uses are not hemp uses, this does not prohibit that, and a little tweak that to that language might give you just enough to have some sort of enforcement ability in the beginning without major revisions to your ordinance. Again, we are in support of this and um, just wanted to bring those to your attention. Thank you. Next speaker is A.J. Tota. As he's coming up, Sandy, you make sure you make a note of that, that last comment. Let's talk about that again later. Thank you. Is this on this topic or on seven? Seven. Are you speaking to the county proposal for the Edgemore property? Oh, yes. Okay. That was in the wrong slot. Sorry. No further speakers, sir. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, who wants to lead off? Uh, I will. Okay. Motion to approve. Any other comments or questions? I just want to mirror Councilmember McNellis's comment about adding some language about hemp use because we weren't aware. Yeah, I sent that issue. to Sean earlier, the email. So, Yeah, um, Mayor and uh, members of the council will certainly take a look at that and uh, assess it and bring back recommendations. Thank you. Then I'll second the motion. All right, I have a motion second. Please vote. I just miss Vice Mayor Trotter. That means Motion coming carries back. with yeah. three eyes. Okay. You want to wait for him or get started? Oh, of course we have to wait. Okay. <laughs> Item number eight, you can come back now. Man, I had to ask twice. He was eating my burrito. <laughs> Sir, it's item nine. I had nine. That's what I said, isn't it? You said eight. Oh. I mean, uh, you said nine. You're correct. You, know, you may go far yet. All right. That takes to item number nine, which is general fund reserve policy discussion. Heather. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, and, and city council members. Uh, tonight, we am bringing forward for your review and discussion a um, presentation on the general fund reserve policy. So um, we'll go through tonight what the purpose of the general fund reserve is, some background about Santee, um, some discussion about the different types of reserves available or out there, and then I am looking for recommendations from you all, to, and then I will come back with a policy based on your recommendations. So the general fund reserve is, is like the picture there. It's basically a rainy day fund. Um, it assists the city in mitigating risk by protecting the city financially during economic downturns or unexpected emergencies. 
It also provides liquidity and establishes city credit worthiness. The purpose of tonight's discussion is to, to memorialize the city's reserve policy into a formal council adopted policy if desired. Additionally, take the opportunity to revisit the city's reserve practice and make any updates also if desired. So a little bit of background <clears throat> about the city of Santee. Um, we currently, the Santee currently has a 20% general fund reserve policy. And since its incorporation, the city has made having a healthy reserve a priority. Over the last 20 years, the reserve policy has been met except for three years due to extreme financial events in 2012, 2013, and 2014. <clears throat> the city was actually hit with a one-two punch. The first punch was in 2009, which was the Great Recession. Uh, property tax and sales tax, our two largest revenue sources, were very negatively affected. Um, the city was still able to keep above the 20% reserve, <clears throat> excuse me, but in 2012 with the dissolution of redevelopment, the general fund um, absorbed many of the costs of the former uh, Santee Community Development Commission. So it was, that was the, the second punch. Um, so uh, the reserve is adopted each year through the budget resolution. So the city has other funds that have quasi reserves and I wanted to just let you know about these as well. Um, we have a workers' compensation fund with $1.2 million in it. This fund, um, the amount is, is an actuarial calculation of outstanding, liability, li outstanding liabilities. Any current year worker, workers' comp expenditures are actually budgeted and paid for in the department budgets. So we do not touch this, this, this balance, but it's there if we need to. The same is true with the risk liability fund. The balance there is 271,000. We also have a vehicle replacement fund with a unrestricted fund balance, which is available for emergencies of 700,000. We did dip into this a little bit in the last couple of years with all of the, the increasing costs for vehicles. Um, so it was, it was available for, for, the, for that use. Um, we added this year a technology replacement fund. Um, we are planning on an annual allocation, and this, this fund would cover citywide IT hardware and software updates. So a little bit, you know, uh, steady allocations for the big expenditures down the road. So having, having these, re these quasi-reserves help protect the general fund from unforeseen events and provide solid financial planning. So as mentioned in the first slide, the purpose of tonight's discussion is to memorialize the city's reserve policy into a council adopted policy incorporating the government financer, finance officers associations recommendation. These um, recommendations on this slide um, are what GFOA considers to be the best practice of a general fund reserve policy. Um, within the policy, the type and level of reserve should be identified. Um, that, that reserve amount should take into effect revenue and expenditure extremes, infrastructure, potential infrastructure failures, natural disaster, extreme events, and then the need for liquidity. The policy should also address circumstances warranting, warranting the use of funds. What is the trigger? Is it a council majority vote? In addition, um, a replenishment plan should be in the policy so that when for reserve funds are depleted, um, there's a plan to, to restore them. A typical replenishment plan is one to, two th one to three years, but can vary depending on, on the circumstances and how many funds were depleted. And a reserve minimum should be 16.67%, which, which equates to two months of expenditures. So there are different different types of reserves and depending on council's goals um, you could basically do any type of reserve that you would that you wanted these three right these three on this slide are the most common reserves um, the operating reserve is your basic reserve it's applicable to any type of circumstance circumstance disaster recession etc it's your basic reserve um, then there is an economic contingency reserve, which would be specific for significant revenue losses or other large economic events. This would typically have an economic trigger. Um, I consider this to be an add-on reserve, smaller in size than an operating reserve. 
this would be used before in, in a in a in a situation where revenues were significantly lower and we, and funds were needed. This would be used before dipping into an operating reserve. Uh, catastrophic event reserve is also a, an add-on reserve. Um, this would be restricted for catastrophic events, natural disasters, cyber threats, anything of that nature. Um, the trigger would most likely be the dec declaration of an emergency. Um, and it's also worth noting that these reserves are buildable. They can be built up over time depending on the funds available. They don't need to be funded right away. They're, they can be built up over, through, over the years. So the next topic are assignments. Um, assignments are not necessarily reserves. They're, they're different in that they're intended to be spent at a later date. Um, so an assignment is kind of like a rule applied to excess unrestricted fund balance. It can be used to build up funding for a future program or project, um, build up funding to fund a reserve. Um, typically, a percentage of the surplus or an identified dollar amount is stated. Common types of assignments, unfunded liabilities, um, CIP projects, deferred maintenance. So this is a sample of um, some, of, there's eight San Diego County cities and three California cities. Um, and you can see that most cities do have an operating reserve. There's about half that have an economic contingency reserve. And then in, in this sampling, only one has a catastrophic event reserve. The um, columns with the green, um, green titles there, um, those are basically assignments. So um, these, these are definitely would be spent at a later date. So with that, um, I'd like to present staff recommendations. Um, staff would like um, you to provide direction regarding the following items related to the general fund reserve policy. The types and level of funding triggers, what triggers the use of the reserve fund, uh, a replenishment plan, and discuss any assignments. And staff will return with a reserve policy for city council's consideration, incorporating the direction given this evening. And it, it also should be noted that the current reserve that we have is, is a good reserve and it's, it's very solid. And if, if council doesn't want to change anything, that is okay too. Thank you. We do not have any speaker slips on this. Um, Vice Mayor, do you want to go first on this? No. Uh, Rob, how about you? All right, former vice mayor. Okay. All right, I have a lot of notes, sorry. Um, I do have some experience, actually, with uh, this kind of funding, and, it, and, and I applaud staff. We actually have a, a good system, and a solid system in place. Um, I do want to change it, though. <laughs> I want to enhance it. Uh, is what I'll say. So um, I thought a lot about this, and that's why I asked Heather to pull some data for all of us, basically where we were each fiscal year for the last 20 years, how much we had in our reserves. So that's that list. Um, and I think what we need is a couple of things. One, a, a budgetary allocation. So I like the 20%. I'll start with saying that. Um, but then add a budgetary allocation. So this would be a line item in the annual budget specifically designated for replenishing the reserve fund. This demonstrates a commitment to rebuilding the reserve and ensures that it receives priority consideration during the budgeting process. And for right now, it could be zero because we're not in that situation. But we should, if we don't already have some kind of line item to say we're going to replenish when we dip into this reserve fund, we should have it. Um, and the reason why I say that is, you know, when we do go back to the actual mid-year budget, um, what, what I found in these last couple of years is that we have our council priorities. Sorry if you can't hear me. We have our council priorities, and then we have this budget review, and we discuss it, and then something will come up that we didn't anticipate. And what comes to mind is how much um, the lighting at the ball, ball fields cost. And I think the initial estimate was somewhere around 700000 and I think it was closer to $2 million. In my mind, that is an unfunded 
thing that should come from, that money should have come from the reserve, the 20% reserve, reserve, and then we have a policy in place to replenish the reserve because that wasn't one of our priorities. It wasn't a line item in a budget we could review anywhere, and it was what you call an emergency, whether it be capital or whatever. So that's why I say add the line item so we have a way to look back to that. Um, this is somewhat related to, to this process, but I don't know if we have a routine debt management process in place already. So um, do we have existing debt that re, we re, refinance uh, to secure more favorable terms? or uh, The city currently does not have any, any long-term debt. The only debt that we actually have are capital leases. Will we have one when we do the community center? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. No. Okay. Um, and then, then of, of course, the reserve replenishment policy. So establish a formal policy or guideline outlining the conditions and mechanisms for replenishing the reserve fund. Um, and I have a few examples. So there's an annual surplus allocation idea, which is, say, our reserve policy is 20%. Um, and then we can allocate any portion of any annual budget surplus to re replenish the sur reserve fund if we have a deficit based on some unforeseen circumstance. Um, but the challenge into that model is that, you know, you have to dip into reserves. And if, you're, if you have some kind of emergency situation, where, like a lot of people probably have the same one. So I don't really think that the annual surplus allocation would work, but maybe an incremental replacement or replenishment would work. Um, and this is establish a schedule for incremental replenishment of the reserve fund for a specific period. And I like the idea of over three years. I think that's manageable. Allocate a predetermined amount each year from the general fund budget to replenish the reserve until it reaches the target level. So for example, allocate 1% of the operating budget each year for three years to repl replenish the reserve fund. Um, and I think that's more realistic because it allows for um, budget cut triggers, which if we were in that situation, then every department would have to look at budget cuts to replenish the reserve. And I don't know if that we've ever had to do that. So, And, and that would become part of our strategic recovery plan. And um, let's see. So I, this is the formula that I wrote. Um, based on the 20 years, it seems like the sweet spot for us is that is that 22% that we have? So um, at 22%, 1% of this fund, once we hit 22%, our, our reserve is 20, but once we hit 22%, 1% of that surplus would go fund our line item that I mentioned before, but then we would have a ceiling of 5% on it. And the reason I say that is because you don't want to build that up to just infinity. And I think the council likes to be able to address annual needs annually while we have the money. As I always remember you said, fix the roads when you have the money, right? When we first started, when I first started. So I don't want to just say put everything extra into this, you know, reserve replenishment fund, but at least when we're at 22%, the trigger is now we put 1% into that and we have some money there in case we have an emergency. And then once it hits 5% in that reserve, then all the extra above and beyond that goes to annual needs. And I say that because this year we're at 31%. So we could hit the 22%, put us 1% aside, and still have money to work with tonight. So that's my formula. Did, did you want to max that out per year? Or just? Per, it's 1% a year, maxed at 5%. We're never, you know, if... If, well, what if, if we have five years of over 22%? We have five million. Do we want to max it maybe at 500,000 or do you want to just 1%? No, just 1%. Okay. Which is that? Um, okay. Um, you know, I, I like the 20%, frankly. I, I'm looking at Poway, which, you know, drooling over Poway's, but uh, 45%. <laughs> but I'm also looking at 15%, and I know the way uh, MTS is uh, with their reserves. So. Uh, they're going to be broke in five years. Um, but other than that, they're usually about 12. So uh, so basically, we'll, 
I think if we stayed at 20, I kind of like part of what your idea uh, at two, but I would like to put some kind of cap on it. But I'm, I'm okay with your plan there. Other than that. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a question, though. Um, on the city of Santee background, um, on slide number five, um, we point out the um, reserves, of, for instance, workers' compensation, risk liability, and vehicle replacement, and technology replacement fund, which doesn't have a number yet. My question is basically, are these restricted funds are, and or can they um, be spent down if we don't want to, like, I'm just taking the big number. Let's say that we're short someplace because of uh, needs. Could we take that $1.2 million or a portion of that $1.2 million, or are we making those restricted so that they are there to cover those liabilities? For obvious reasons in this one, you want to make sure that you're always covering your uh, liability, uh, which is obviously the um, poor, uh, comp workers' compensation, et cetera. Is that question makes sense the mm -hmm. way I put it for workers compensation and risk I would I would actually um, well let me back up they're not they're not restricted by law or legally restricted or 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 by council um, but they are kind of like insurance so yeah. they are our insurance policy um, I I would not um, recommend spending those for sure but um, the vehicle replacement that is um, not restricted, uh, not restricted either, but is is a cushion for an emergency. Okay. Well, the reason why I'm asking that question, oh, and also, would that be the same on uh, slide number eight, where we went into general fund uh, reserve discussion and the assignments and rules and things of that nature? Because we, oops, um, uh, this is. Uh, where I made this note, it says uh, general fund reserve discussion. There we go. Um, so because it, it's also talking about building programs, and, and I think that's kind of the same thing that we were talking on that previous slide about the liabilities and, and all that kind of stuff. Because I think that if we do create a policy, we should create a policy that says these are restricted funds. And that's so that um, you don't, you really don't have to think about it. You know, you're not taking money from there, because let's say in you know five years or ten years, it's a different council. They haven't been through this. There's, you know, some of the staff is gone. Doesn't really remember the um, discussion that was had today, and they're going to go, oh well, we got 1.2 million dollars, and somebody didn't catch anywhere. We didn't have a um, policy on it. And they go, well, let's spend that money. We got it. And I think that's where some governments get in trouble because they spend money that they've been saving for their rainy day. And we never know what the state of California is going to do by hitting us up for our CalPERS, I should say, or even, you know, uh, as far as workers' comp, uh, what are they going to hit us up with next? So I think that deciding on a policy to restrict those funds for what they were meant for is a good idea. And, and then I have a question about workman's comp, because I agree with that. But I think in the budget part, it shows three different areas we're over that we have to take from the surplus that we have right now to cover some workman's comp. So in the current for, for the current year, we budget all of our projected workers' comp costs and our actual costs in the department budget. So we don't touch the 1.2. That that just sits there all by itself, no ins and outs or anything. We just we budget for the current year and we pay the current year. So what you're seeing in the mid year is just the increase from what our projection was to what the actuals are. Great. And, and Did we ever go to the workman's comp one point two million then? Or? No, it's it's there only it's there for an emergency. It's and it's the actuarial calculated um, our liability, and it's it's also the fact that we have that that amount in that fund helps with our calculation for um, f for on our financial state statements, our liability. It helps with that because it kind of offsets it. And my guess is that the reason why we would call that a um, insurance policy is if we have uh, someone who is uh, maybe 
gets killed in line of duty, whether it's firefighters or otherwise. And uh, there could be some kind of liability brought forward. Somebody could say that, uh, you know, we, you know, didn't do something right as far as safety goes or whatever. And then, um, so they're going to make a big uh, claim on workers' comp. And we have to be, you know, ready for that. Uh, now, it might be a little bit different the way I, you know, from what I described, but, you know, my experience is that, um, you know, families who are injured by something that happens to a loved one on the job are looking to be compensated any way they can, and we have to be prepared for that. And so that's why, um, another reason why I would want that restricted. I, I definitely want it res restricted, but I just, that's, is that how... This fund would be used if there was some crazy amount. Are you just using it to get the the front end rate? Or well, I, I mean, we use it to to have that backup in case in case something does happen. Um, so it's kind of a buffer for the general fund, um, just an added layer of buffer. And then we use it also for calculating the rate. Have we ever dipped into that fund? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I in the past, um, let's see, four years we've been adding to it. Um, we've added, um, I think it was in 2022, we added 200,000 to it. I think 2023, we added 150,000 to it to get it up to that 1.2, which matched our actuarial liability. But is I don't think that we have dipped into it, at least if it hasn't been any time lately. Heather, can you give us an example of when that would be used? Just so we're all on the same page, not guessing. When when would that money be used? When when would we have to use that? What is a scenario? I would think that if we were in a very bad um, budget scenario and we were we were out of money or we needed it for for um, that was a way to pay, make the payment. It's kind of like a an add on reserve where we would use it for for workers comp claim that we you know if we needed to. Okay, that's. But we would have to be pretty, you know, fis fiscally, you know, depleted. <laughs> yeah, depleted. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Great. And, and then um, also, for me, I always like having more in my bank account than what I think I'm going to ever need. So twenty percent. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. 25 sounds good. 45 maybe a little bit excessive. Uh, if you have it. Yeah. Well, if you have it. Um, but I think that um, that reaching for a little bit higher goal, maybe even a 22%, 23% is uh, better uh, because you just you never know what's going to happen. And today I think it was, what, two, per, uh, two months worth of uh, reserve? Would cover certain things. Well, I think that was as a minimum. Yeah, the sixteen sixteen point six seven percent is the the recommended minimum. Right, right. Uh, but I'm thinking bigger than the you know the minimum um, because I know that uh, if if I'm just thinking about my household needs and I don't have the savings, which a reserve account really is kind of. I think that's, uh, I'm really doing myself a disservice, so I don't want to do a disservice to the community. And then also as far as uh, some of the things that we do, um, I think we should have a designated amount of money that gets uh, put away um, every time, you know, there's a, um, you know, uh, there's money that's been released. Uh, for instance, and um, that could cover capital improvements projects. Doesn't mean that we have to spend it every single time, but uh, for failures, I know that we we've talked about this before. You have failures in streets or other things that cause a, a high level of um, monetary damage, for lack of a better term. Yeah, remember on oh yeah Pearl Street, we had that big yep. Uh, sinkhole. Yep. Um, the only thing that we got lucky on there is the fact that it uh, wasn't on our Audrey Dam had to pay for it because it was their failure. But what if that was our failure? And um, that was devastating, would have been very devastating, and probably may even went through a 
big chunk of that reserve. Oh yeah, yeah, because you remember that. Oh, I totally do, and I remember times where we we did have twenty two and twenty three percent in reserves. Um, you know, but here's my other side of that, if that's okay. Okay. My other side of that is, <clears throat> and, and I understand what everybody's saying over here. We've got to have reserves, and twenty percent has been kind of our minimum uh, that we've utilized in the past as as our as our goal minimum. Um, more is always better, but the reality is we st- we have work to do now. Like we, we have work to do now. We have roads that need to be paved now. We have uh, s- some of our parks that need repair already now. We have, as we're talking about, the uh, we're going to be talking about the community center that needs help now. It, we've got uh, the, as- the AstroTurf for the, the synthetic turf at and Town Center Community Park East needs repair now. Uh, there's a number of things that, that we really, because we unfortunately – didn't do a, uh, put a lot of money into these things in the past. We are paying a little bit more for that now. We've been blessed to have a little bit of an excess at this moment that we maybe should be utilizing to take care of these issues, so they don't they don't fester and get even worse into the future. Um, I like the twenty percent budget as it is, or the twenty percent reserve as it is. The more. I mean, I understand restricting it to catastrophe and, all right, we've got to have a majority vote of the council in order to, to go past that 20% reserve uh, minimum. I'm fine with that. But until we have these other things taken care of, I don't, I don't see putting more money into that reserve until we've taken care of the issues that are eminent right now. Uh, that's my actual concern. The longer we wait to do that stuff because we want to put extra money away, the more it's going to cost us in the near future to take care of it then. And so I, you know, I prefer to pretty much keep it the way it is. If you want to add a restriction to uh, the liability fund and, uh, or the workers comp fund and, and the other kind the other two funds, if you want to add a restriction to those that are already in, in budget and done and already uh, uh, calculated for totally fine with that as well. Um, but, and once again, uh, a written policy of, it takes a majority of the council to approve going into the reserve fund at any time. Um, I don't think we need to go into, well, it has to be a declared catastrophe. We have to do this. Once you start restricting it too much, then it gets very convoluted, in my opinion. So a majority of the council that says, hey, yep, we need this for whatever reason may, that may come up, I'm totally fine with that. But other than that, I think we, you know, instead of putting more money away, then we need to spend the money that we've got over and above our reserves mm-hmm. to take care of the things that we're supposed to be taking care of as council members. Well, I fixing just, streets, I just fixing clarify, potholes. I'm not in disagreement <clears throat> with you. It's just I'm looking for a better way to um, account for it because what I feel like is that our council priorities, you know, get knocked down because something like, you know, this synthetic turf, item comes up and that's 660,000 or the the ball field lights or whatever it may be and um, I, I'm looking at you know the council priorities that we all agreed on one is the future financial software upgrade and we need to do that and I don't know that it's fully funded and maybe and so we need so if if a item comes before us that's six hundred and sixty thousand dollars and we're all going oh my gosh you know, there should be a process in place to, to move that money from the reserve because that shouldn't impact our council priorities. That's, what, that's where I'm coming from. So there, there's that. <clears throat> you know, Big Rock Park, we've $770,000 there. There's been some small financial investments, very minor, not, not even probably $100,000. Um, but we, you know, after the community center is done, we know we have to do that next, but this one will now jump those two items. And, and the community center is one of ours. And I think that the development impact fee study is all funded and done. But, you know, I just want to make sure that we're always staying on track with our, our council priorities, which most, mostly we are. But when we have a wild card thrown in, we don't have a process in place to address that. So that's what I'm looking to do. And that's, what, that's where I came up with the 22%, just based on 20-year averages and this and that and the other thing. To make sure that, okay, well, if something does come up that we all didn't know about, but we have to take care of it, 
moving forward, we, we don't lose our priorities and we still have a way to replenish that fund over three years um, through the budget process instead of a surprise right now. Uh, I, th I think we've kind of been doing that, though, haven't we? No. No. Well, in in some ways, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. It, it's, it's kind of a yes and no. Yeah. Um, and the reason why it's a yes because staff has done such a great job of making sure that we don't overspend. Um, and um, and the other side of no is because there's nothing written down. And so. Uh, so anyways, I, I think there's some very good discussion that we've had here tonight, great ideas, uh, and that's, that's what's so cool about what we do is having our ideas shared. My only question now is, uh, City Manager, did you, do you have anything to add? And also, um, have you heard, an, well, I didn't think you were going to say anything. You told me no. You asked if I want to speak first. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't say he didn't want to speak. Yeah. I stand correct. I'll sit corrected. How's that sound? You know, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So, you know, this, this has been a big, a big deal. Budgets, you know, for the last three years, we've talked a lot about this and a lot of things that we haven't, um, haven't been putting money away for, haven't had a plan for and priorities, right? It's all these different terms in there. Spent a lot of time thinking about this, and that's why I asked to have this go first because it does affect our next discussion with our you know, mid-year budget and our budget going forward in the, in the new fiscal year. Um, there's, I do believe that we need a policy for this. I, I think it's something that, that we need to create. It's something that, that should be in place. Uh, so, Heather, thank you for bringing this forward because it, it's we're there, right? But I, I'm, I'm good with the 20% also. I thought a lot about this, you know, going up, going down. It's always good to have more money. It's always good to save more money. It's, it's, it's a blessing that we have a... a, a um, extra money in our reserves today, right? But we also, just like you talked about, Rob, priorities of fixing roads and public safety, things like that, we also have an obligation to spend the people's money, too, you know, to, to fund what is expected with the, with the tax money and the dollars that are brought into the city from sales tax and, and property tax revenue. And those expectations, you know, start at those top things that I just mentioned, paving the roads and public safety. And we go down from there when we hit priorities. The city... The constituents expect us to put these dollars back into the city. And if the more that we hold on to them and hold on to them, that's not pertinent on us. As much as I don't like that, being physically conservative, you know, it, there's a balance that we have to figure out what's, what's good for the people, what's good for us in there. Um, Laura, I want to go back, if you don't mind indulging me here a little bit, on this budget, budgetary allocation and a surplus, because... I think you're onto something there, and I, and I was trying to just make sure that I'm understanding it all the way through. The replenish part of it, I agree with you, three years. That I, you, know, I, you can't replenish something in one year. It just doesn't work, right? You, you have to have necessarily. So I think the three-year timeline to replenish something, if we dip under whatever that, that threshold is, have a maximum in there. Um, I didn't understand the routine debt management part of it. That, that I didn't fully, I don't know if that's, that's part. That was just more of a question. Okay. For, um, I wrote a question mark next to it. <laughs> We're good. We're good. All right. So budgetary allocation, annual surplus. Can you give me another recap here, like what you, what that means, I guess? It so the annual surplus, um, that was one of the options, and I, I don't think. Is your mic on? So, I'm sorry, it's not. I don't think that's the best option. I think I'm leaning towards incremental replenishment, which is kind of what we just talked about. Yeah. And what I mean by that, by that is so we have the 20% reserve. At 22%, which that's why I looked at 20 years, how many times did we go 22% or more? So as our we reserves one, increases. We put 1% right. in that line item that I talked about for $660,000 for blah, blah, blah. blah. And, and then I, 23, 24, 25, 26. All I'm that missing that line item, too. I, I get that. I get that I'm missing the line item. So is this an assignment, like a separate fund, like a... Um, Yes. Is that that an a facilities fund? fund a, it's a different I just said we would add a budgetary a line item in the annual budget spe specifically designated for replenishing the reserve fund, and and that's where that one percent would go. That li that one percent goes because so it, it actually it starts with what you were talking about at the beginning is not taking the money out of the general fund, not taking it from another source when we have a. A, unforeseen. Some, an unforeseen thing. You take it out of reserve first mm -hmm. and not out of, again, the general fund or another source of pool taken away from a CIP project or something else. And then as we dip down, we need to replenish right. it. 
Okay. Right. It's just a, recap it's, that? it's procedure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it's a no shoot me. fund. Well, I, yeah. I, I thought I understood most of it, but I just really wanted to get that out there because I, I think you're onto something there. I, I think it's it's important that we have a process to replenish it. Number one, if we do dip down, but the process of how we how we allocate the funds. I mean, that's really what this all a lot of this comes down to is. It, how do we take, where do we get the money from to do what we have to do? So what's 1% of the budget? It'd be, be 580000 Okay. roughly. So, yeah, that's one year of you know, unfunded thing almost. I mean, two years, that unfunded issue that we have that doesn't align with our top 10 council priorities or anything that we've seen in the budget that we've approved over the last year. It's a, it's a wild card as there would be a process in place. What, what hap- to your point, um, Vice Mayor Trotter, is what happens when, when these things happen, and they do happen, so I'm not, it's not about that. It's that another department has to cut, cut, cut to make up for this thing that no, none of us budgeted for. And, and that's the whole point of a reserve. <laughs> which is why we, which is how we've used the reserve. It's just we well, haven't we had it. We, well, yeah. we actually, we have. Well, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, well, yeah, yeah and, right. I mean, they, they, they come. and it's, and money, and then we find money to put it back in, in other ways later down the road. It's, but, so you're, you're proposing a, a new line item in the budget, the just in case fund. Right. And I say, and I'm saying this year at zero, well, maybe not zero dollars because we do have this thing in there, but. And anytime we, all of it now. fair enough, anytime we go over 22%. Mm-hmm. 1% goes in there. Okay. And that's it. Until it, and it, when that fund reaches 5% of the overall budget, of the overall budget, no more funds go into that. It's, it's capped. And Mayor Mento, you mentioned something about designated money put away. Uh, that, is that similar to, to, to this? Res- restricted funds, very, restricted. very se- similar. It's, it's where you just, it's said you can, like, for instance, we're going to buy water and we're not buying anything else with that money. So that means you're not buying soda pop with that water. With that water? With that money, I mean. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I, you know, we, we obviously have a, we talked about it last discussion, right? We have major issues with our facilities, um, either being under maintenance or not being built, um, you know, for uh, public safety and things. So you talk about, a, you know, a plan to how do we get money in the future? Because, you know, we're going to talk about it here in the next item, the, the turf, the synthetic turf is you know, so we have to replace this, this turf at Town Center Park um, that was built, put in, what, 14 years ago, 16 years ago, whatever it was, that has a life expectancy of 10 years, right? And we don't have any dollars, like you said, in a fund <laughs> to replace it. And this is, you know, everything has life ex- We're going to get to that in a minute, but I, 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 it, yeah. so I get too far into that. But, I mean, that's some of the, con- the conversation, I guess, what we're talking about, right? That's why I wanted to have this conversation a little bit before, because it does affect, you know, possibly I, some of the things going forward, in theory, of percentages and numbers of what were above our our standard policy today right right now because nobody uh, nobody wants to think of those things when they're brand new because right. they're brand new and right. so hey okay they're brand new we don't have to worry about the maintenance of it but over time it's gonna not be brand new our it happened to our roads which is why we're dealing with what we're dealing with now when the city of santee was incorporated in 1980 it was all brand new i mean and it's been, we've had brand new roads built since then and many of them so it takes 20 years trying to get to your more of your uh questions here heather i apologize so I'm more in favor of keeping at the 20%. Um, as I've looked at the up and down and, and the advantage and the disadvantages, you know, the, the type of policy that we use today, this, uh, I don't know what the term was, I forgot now, drawing a blank, whatever the type we use today, it gives us the most flexibility mm-hmm. in, in what we do. And we got to make sure that we are flexible enough to, to do what we have to do. We don't over encumber ourselves that and restrict ourselves too much, right? right? That's it, what I'm worried about. Right, that we have to make sure that we are Again, we're not hand tied. You're know, not hand tied, but we're being pertinent with the people's money. We're we're doing the right, <laughs> prudent. That's what I'm going to say. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm the twenty percent, um, Heather. I you asked about the replen- th- if we do an replenishment, replenishment fund or our plan one to three years standard. I think makes a lot of sense. Um, the majority council vote for any circumstances warranting the funds. Absolutely, I think it, there has to be a mm-hmm. you know a majority vote um, by the the council to dip into a fund or use funds or, or anything of the above. Um, 
somewhat what well, way we do it right now is the right or is a good way that we're doing it. I uh, think we do need to memorialize it though in in a policy here. Um, I think it'll help not only us, it'll help in the future. Um, from my understanding, it'll help actually our financial position a little bit more that we have we have a a real we have a formalized policy that we can utilize to show the strength of the city's you know finances and stuff. So, so if I could say this, that because uh, I want to hear from uh, city manager, though, but I, I think so far where we've gone with this, there's a lot of information that I, I've been seeing a lot of note taking done, and so we might be almost to the point where we give direction for um, staff to bring back actually a draft uh, policy on this, and um, and if everybody feels comfortable, we can do that. Let me go ahead and hear from city manager first and, and and make sure that everything is understood that we've talked about tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Certainly we'll consult with Heather. She's going to be a big part of any action going forward. But it sounds, from what I'm hearing from council, um, that you like many of the concepts that our Councilwoman Koval brought forward. But it seems most of you like the flexibility of the policies we have now. But to memorialize those, to put that down in writing with... Um, Ob obligations on the part of the city of Santee if we want to dip into the reserves what that would take and if we do that what would be the replacement policies how we would handle that um, and if I'm I just want to make sure um, the 22 percent plus one plus one plus one uh, 22 percent plus one and then over three years okay so I, I, I have it written down I can just hand it I'm just curious. It sounded to me mostly that we were looking at keeping it at 20% rather than 22. Correct. Um, it's 20%. But when the surplus, the trigger for the surplus is 22%, where we would put 1% in the line item that I said, the annual surplus allocation line item in the budget and max it at 5%. Okay. So just for my understanding, um, and Heather, you can correct me if I'm, if I, You've got it. That's great. Um, we would have that set aside in a separate fund. Is that a part of the reserve or is that? It's reserve. It's general fund reserve, general unrestricted, reserve? but it's to address. It's a way to properly address something like the, the okay. lights at the ball field, the things that we didn't see. Okay. From, from what, can I, may I chime Please. in? Um, from what I, if I'm understanding correctly, the, the Laura, the, the reserve is 20%. Anything above 22, we take 1% of that and we put it into kind of like an assignment yep. up to 5%. Yep. So effectively, that's almost a 25% reserve if it never gets, you know, if we never draw it down or anything like that. Correct. Um, but it does seem like every year, and it, I don't want to say every year, but a lot of years we have something come up that's, you know, from half a million to $2 million dollars. That wasn't addressed, and so this is a way to to use the general fund reserve as it's intended, and then also replenish it, and not steer, not have all the department heads go, oh well, you got to cut out these things because you know we there's this unexpected budget issue that arose. This should be a team effort to replenish it, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay, we'll we'll take a stab at that and bring back. I know. Great. <laughs> well, you know that's the one good thing about, like I said, having all these different ideas coming up, and and uh, we all seem to be very similar in thought here, uh, with just a few variations on what we think is a good deal. Not everybody's going to get what they want. It's like buying a car; dealers not getting what they want. We may not get what we want, but you know what? At the end of the day, we bought a car. So, I, it's not it's not a house, Rob. <laughs> All right, then that takes us to item number item number nine. Uh, C City clerk, which item did I just call? You called item number eight, sir. Oh, thank you. That was a setup. <laughs> So uh, fiscal year 2023-24, operating budget update and resolution amending the fiscal year 2023-24 budget. This is a mid-year um, 
report. Heather? Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Uh, this is the 2023-24 Mid-Year Operating Budget Update. So I thought we'd start off with how we did in fiscal year 22-23. Um, we closed the year with $17 million in unrestricted fund balance. This was $4 million more than projected when we did the adopted budget. The primary drivers of this increase is a $1.3 million um, increase in revenues, primarily property tax and sales tax, and expenditure savings across all departments. We had... Pers we had a lot of personnel salary, personnel salary savings and unfilled positions, um, primarily in finance, engineering, community services, HR. Uh, we also had some savings in the, in the sheriff contract due to vacancies and insurance premium savings, and then we saved on utilities. So stepping into this fiscal year, um, so our financial position has improved from the original adopted budget by 5.2 million. Part of that is the 4 million from the previous slide. Um, the rest of it is estimated revenues are now stronger than initially projected by about 2.4 million. So our projected reserve balance is 17.3 million at June 30, 2024. This is a snapshot of the mid-year amended budget. Uh, revenues are projected to be 59 million. Expenditures, uh, 57.2 million. That leaves us revenues over expenditures of almost 1.8 million. We've got some transfers in the other financing sources um, of 2.8 million. This is mostly ARPA, which we'll get to on a later slide. Um, some transfers out to other operating funds, about 660,000. And then transfers to capital improvement program, 3.6 million. This also includes ARPA. And then the unfunded liability payment or the additional discretionary payment to CalPERS of $600,000. Um, this leaves us with an available fund balance of $17.3 million. So we'll start off with revenues. Um, we're looking at $59 million, um, $2.4 million. Um, overall increase in projected revenues from the original adopted budget. Our major revenue, um, or our, our biggest revenue, is property tax, uh, $25.1 million in total. This is about 485000 more than the original budget estimate and $1 million more than uh, 2022's um, actual actuals. This is driven by a 7.1% increase in net assessed valuation. Our next biggest revenue source is sales tax. Uh, we are actually projecting almost a million dollars um, of an increase from the original budget estimate and um, about 332000 more than the ending balance of last fiscal year. This increase is primarily due to growth in the following areas. Building and construction, we had very strong growth, uh, general consumer goods, mediocre growth, and then the county pool allocation. We had growth in this area, but this was mostly driven by the building and construction growth. Some other notable revenues, uh, trans transient, o transient occupancy tax. We are projecting 790,000 in annual revenue. Our franchise fees, we're looking at 3.8 million in total annual revenue with large um, increases from the, from the original estimate. Emergency medical services, 5.1 million in revenue. Um, this, is, this should be noted, this is a one-to-one -one relationship with the, um, the, EMS depart or the, the EMS division of the fire department, so this matches whatever is spent in that, in that division. Um, and then building permit revenue, uh, 1.1 million. This is a $200,000 increase. So our 200 or 2023-24 expenditures, we're looking at 57.2 million, uh, 682,000 over our current budget. We'll begin here with the personnel costs. We've we are requesting a building development technician. This is a upgrade from a part-time position to a full-time position, um, and. And along with the, along, there is an increase of $50,000, but we're also expecting savings in the actual, in the, in the contract staff costs. 
the next item is employee benefit employee benefit elections. This is just a correction to um, what we assumed when we were creating the budget to what actual what actual what the employees actually took for elections, and then part time salaries in the finance department. So these are the other general fund depart or other general fund expenditure increases. By department, um, city manager, and economic development, we've got um, money budgeted for Empower East County Business Fund project. This was originally in the ARPA fund, but it was requested that this not come from ARPA money, so and that it be a general fund expense. So we are we are making that adjustment. Um, surplus land disposition, uh, city attorney, community oriented policing, and cannabis implementation. Information technology, we have the GIS consultant that we will be using until we can get that position filled. Uh, finance, credit card processing fees, fire station infrastructure services, financing analysis, <clears throat> community services and public service, workers' compensation costs and electricity costs, and then fire, also workers' compensation costs, and the replacement of obsolete radios. And then in addition, there is the synthetic turf field replacement, and this would be a transfer from the general fund to the CIP fund. So uh, the American Rescue Plan. So due to ARPA spending deadlines and current project demands from the engineering department, we are proposing to swap the funding sources for the following CIP projects. And the way it would work is we would transfer this the amount of these four CIP projects from from ARPA, the ARPA fund, into the general fund, and then from the general fund we would transfer the same amount into the into the um, the CIP fund. Um, there's also fifty thousand dollars here for the river ordinance enforcement. And this was the was mentioned in the city attorney's budget. And then 40000 mentioned earlier from Empower East County Business Fund Project. So now to the general fund unrestricted fund balance. As mentioned, we have $17.3 million or 30.3% of general fund operating expenditures. And then the balance available beyond the 20% reserve is $5.9 million. Considerations for use of unrestricted fund balance of course, it's typically used for only one-time uses, not used for ongoing operational programs. So um, the first item would be to increase the general fund reserve, which we've already gone over. Um, another option would be an additional discretionary payment to CalPERS. Um, there's the, the potential to allocate funding to the pavement repair and maintenance program. As, as noted earlier, the pavement management report recommends an annual paving budget of $4.5 million in order to get our streets to a PCI of 70. Um, in fiscal year 24-25, we have $4.0 million allocated for streets. Um, and then in fiscal year 25-26, we have $2.1 million allocated for streets. So $500,000 in fiscal year 24-25 would get us to the $4.5 million. And then... 2.4 million in fiscal year 25-26 would get us to the 4.5 million. Other other CIP projects include the community center. Um, the way that the community center is set up in the in the CIP budget now, um, bidding and, and construction is programmed in fiscal year 25-26, basically because we're waiting for the accumulation of the development impact fees to cover the construction. We do have a state grant as part of as a funding source for the community center, and it's four point five million dollars. There is some concern regarding the state's budget and um, whether or not the state would claw that those funds back. Um, they should, in a perfect world, they would be spent today. Um, we've also um, just, I think it was last night, received new budget numbers for um, the community center. It's the budget has increased by 1.5 million, and I believe they're due to new building standards. I think engineering can speak better on that than than me. Um, and then general fund, so a general fund contribution of 1.5 million could fast track the project to fiscal year 25 or 24, 25, and this is of course as long as there is enough development impact fees um, received. And then finally, the financial system ERP. Uh, our current software is sunsetting in March 2027. 
um, we have in the CIP budget an estimated project budget of one million um, nine hundred thousand of that is unfunded. So staff's recommendation would be to adopt the resolution approving the amended fiscal year 23-24 budget as outlined in the report, approve the addition of a full-time development technician position in the planning and building department, and provide direction on the use and appropriation of the excess general fund unrestricted <coughs> fund balance. We have no speaker slips. Um, Dustin? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. I'll go first, knock this one out real quick. So, um, I just want to make a couple comments. Actually, going to be directed to a couple of the, you guys and staff members real quick. So, in the building uh, permit revenue, you know, I want to thank Aaron for hard work. Some of it's not your, your result, but it is your, your result. You know, why we have a $200,000 you know, uptick in, in your original estimate. But the statement in here, I'm going to read it out loud to everybody. When the building department function was brought in-house last year, the department changed the way the revenue was budgeted for better reflect the way services are currently provided based on reduced use of contract staff. So kudos to you for everything you've done in that department to get us where we are today. Thank you. Um, next one, actually, it's going to be for Carl because I know where this is coming from. So, Carl, can you tell me why we need uh, window tending on Building 4? <laughs> I, I actually put a thermometer to that this last summer, yeah. and uh, we had temperatures in excess of 85 to 87 degrees in the cubicles and over 100 against the windows. So is that in the cubicles, how, how far are you at? Five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet away? Five feet. Five feet, yeah. So it's, it's mostly everything against that, right? Yeah, it's pretty much all the office cubicles that are on the west-facing sa side of Building 4. They get extremely hot. They just reflect right off the windows, and they're they're just heated yeah. excessively. It's you know it's it's one thing. Also, you don't want to spend money on necessarily, but I think it's important that we take care of the staff. You know, the staff has our support to make sure they're comfortable at work and and doing what they need to do. Right. So, just wanted to kind of throw it out there. Yeah, you know. So, <laughs> uh, next one's gonna be uh, Nick. So, the turf. I'm hundred percent. 100% in support of allocating this funds to you to get this thing done. I don't know how you're going to get it done or what you're going to do or whatever it is, but we need to get this done. There's no question about it, right? So really, I think, I think the understanding is most of the stuff has like a 10-year life expectancy. That's correct. Right. Uh, the fields were actually put into place in 2010, the expectancy of about 9 to 10 years. Right. We're at, encroaching on year 14 at this point, and uh, they're in poor condition, sir. So my challenge to you or my ask of you is to come back not only with all the plan, how you're going to replace them, but how you're going to replace them in the future. Yes, sir. You know, we already have. If a plan you're here in, place. in ten more years, or if somebody else is, that we have a, a mechanism or a way to do that. Well, I don't have any gray hair, so I'll be here in ten years. Okay, let's hope so. Sounds good. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Actually, I appreciate um, one of my colleagues. I don't know which one got our our uh, priorities actually brought to us today again. It's the nerd. <laughs> so every two years, if the public doesn't know, we sit down and as we get a new council, we sit down and go through the priorities uh, for our council and give staff some direction on what is most important things that we can to get done here in the city. So I just want to read two things before I go into my finish my thing here. So um, not in any particular order. It just happens to be this way um, numerically. Um, first one is focus on improvements to the fire station facilities and services. Second one is continue to focus on expanding road paving and other infrastructure improvements. That's two of the 10 priorities in here. Several of the priorities have already been taken care of, are implemented. Some are ongoing and some are forthcoming still, I guess, right? So we have $5.9 million um, above our reserve right now that we can use and allocate somewhere and make, make better use you know, here in, within our city. So some of the things you guys are asking about, I actually... Is a, just give my recommendations here, so go with it. Um, I think we need to take $900,000 and put it into the e, it was ERP replacement project immediately. I think this is one of the highest priorities you know, coming forward for us right now. Um, second is the paving repair and maintenance. I think we need to take $500,000 and $2.4 which is a total, total of $2.9 million, 
and put it into our, um, our plan and our goal for our, our repair, uh, paving, and maintenance. That leaves a difference of, what I have the math, uh, yeah, it's, uh, three, about $2.2 million difference in there. The, sec the last thing is that we have a thing here about fire facilities and services. We've talked, we talked a lot about fire facilities and services in, in the last <laughs> while, right, Chief? <laughs> um, it's a huge priority. It's a huge issue that we have. And I know this is not the norm um, that, that we do with these type of funds, but I do believe um, that we need to seriously look at funding uh, the six additional firefighters that the fire chief asked for. Um, as you know, as soon as possible. If it's not in this, um, you know, allocation here, then we're doing it here in the, the fiscal year coming up. But we do have the funds to do that now, and I do think those are the three highest uh, priorities for me, for our for our city. So. Do, you, do you have the turf in there too, or not? Is that already in there? The, the turf's already in there because everything, the, the additional staffing, all the things the other departments already asked for was what, 682000 or something like that. That's already all built in there. Okay. So that's, I, all, right, just that's all within their, their ask or their, their recommendations to, for their departments. And then there's still $5.9 million beyond that. So 2.9, I'm okay with the roads and because uh, we have to fix the roads. And I uh, can't count on Padre Dam to do them all. And um, nine hundred thousand um, for the software, so it's good to me. And um, I'm sure somebody else can have another one. The fire, I could put part of it in there, but I think we could find another item, put it all in there. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I've said a thousand times. You know, the main priority that we're supposed to have up here: we fill potholes, make sure street lights work, and make sure when you call nine one one, somebody shows up. Those are the main priorities we have as a council. Everything else after that is the fun stuff. So uh, roads, we, we made a plan <clears throat> to get to 70%. We wanted to get to 70%. We, have, we've, we now have an, uh, a way by which we can get closer to that, uh, continue to get closer to that with this extra money. So definitely allocating, it was Heather, there she is, uh, allocating those extra funds to the shortfalls in the coming years. Um, 100% in support of uh, doing that. Uh, obviously, we need, we're need we going to need to pay for the finance program, um, software. I think we should have that implemented this year, right? Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Kathy's going to make sure of that. Um, <laughs> and uh, as far as funding the, funding the firefighters, our paramedics and, and the staff, I, we're, we don't have a place to house them at this time, so having them is, I mean, we've got we've to work that into the budget moving forward, um, but I don't know that this is the appropriate funding mechanism for that at this time. Well, let's, that, let's ask the fire chief. <clears throat> fire chief, those six additional firefighters, what would that cost us annually right now? Roughly a million dollars, something like that? Yeah, starting pay because our because it's it's graduated up as they as they put in more time. The initial costs with pay and benefits approximately eight hundred thousand dollars, but then there's additional costs as far as PPE, looking at about twenty thousand dollars per employee. Um, then the training hours, overtime. <clears throat> so, uh, the question the question it, was, do we have a place to house them? We do, do but it's not plan? optimal. Do you have a plan? <laughs> we do have a plan. And this, is, this has been discussed, we've been discussing this for the better part of the last two years, is it's, it's far from optimal. But can we do it? Yes. Is it optimal to do it? No. My top priority is a third operational fire station, a temporary fire station, because then that allows all of the other dominoes to fall. Right. But we could make, I mean, don't we're we the are, fire department, we, we can make, coming, make anything happen. Don't we have the, that coming this year? It should be coming this year. There is, uh, there is a high likelihood that we will need uh, additional funds beyond the $1 million that's been allocated for that project. Okay, so there's, there's where I would look like to see this go because without a place to right. put people, we don't have... Don't... If I could add a, a little bit of context as, as well uh, for consideration is we have an academy that's just about to start with four personnel. 
We started that process for getting those people to start in November. And they won't be ready to hit the floor until the end of May, June. Um, So if you were to authorize some staffing today, we would not have those people ready to deploy. And that's and that would be if HR was able to prioritize them, which they're incredibly, incredibly busy. Um, they wouldn't be able to be deployed until September, most likely. So just for consideration, so you know the timing anyways. Um, Fair enough. Thank it's you. It's quite, quite a bit of time out. From the time it's just allocated? From the time the funds are allocated or from the time we – because there's a – I'm getting it. I'm yeah, so I cannot, I can't start a process for hiring. I mean, we, we could have a list, but I can't start a process for hiring and offer a job until there's actually a position that's created. So that's just, that's unfortunately just the way it, the way it works. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So, I mean, do we have to allocate the funds in order to create a job position in order to go out to find someone to fill that position within the next Nine months, eight or six months. That's okay. Ron. So yeah, that, and, well, that and was a question actually. I, I, I want Rita, to can you I'm, answer, Rita? I, sorry I about that. Yeah, that. Rita <laughs> is able to help out on this one. It's got to be funded. Okay. That's the problem. Correct, Heather. You have to allocate the money before we can hire for the position. And cre- okay. Before we can create the vacancy and fill it. The the positions would need to be approved by council because they're not currently in the budget. Um, we would need to allocate funds, and then and then fire would need to do their training, or we need to hire and then training. Okay, so then I want to make sure that we first priority for me is funding the shortfall in the roads. Second is the software, and then third would be. No, third would actually be the the positions, and anything left over would go towards the temporary station to help with any offsets of that. Can you? What was number three again? I'm sorry. So uh, number three would be the um, the positions, the fire positions, establishing funds for those positions, and then. Number four would be, and if there's anything left over at that point, would go towards offsetting any unforeseen costs, which are always going to be seen on temporary station. Yeah. Thank you. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, so I, I would like to add the sheriffs in there, too, because um, the sheriffs, uh, we, we, we have to make sure that we have secure city, too, and that's something you're very concerned about. Um, we've looked into, today we actually had a meeting on the Flock software, and um, they came in and they talked about uh, um, the cameras, putting new cameras up. They're going to run a report on how many it'll be. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, but, yeah, the, the cameras actually are, are through the sheriff's department. So we would fund the sheriff's department, and they would actually run this system for us. So by adding this would give us more security in here, let us put them around uh, town center a little bit and actually have uh, Trolley Square and other areas of the town. And we'd make sure if you could take some time and maybe go over to Elkhorn and look at their system, um, you'd be surprised how well it's working for stolen cars. And actually, if, uh, the sheriff was talking about a little bit today. They've caught people from um, up in... Uh, up in what was it, Riverside County that came down here and uh, you were talking about they were doing that? Like, for example, burglary crews that were stealing catalytic converters. Right. And right. Uh, we were able to, because of the readings from those cameras, we were able to kind of pinpoint certain cars that were probably associated with that. And uh, we were able to find them and target them. And then sure enough, they were in, involved in those activities. So it's a, just a way of helping make it more secure in the city, and it's something that we should be looking at because I think you said six out of – how many cities have done it so far? I don't have the exact number, but there are several cities. I know that um, 
our north coastal communities have them, uh, Del Mar, Solana Beach, and... Um, you said San Marcos and Vista are looking at San Marcos them. and Poway are currently in the process of obtaining them, and there's other cities, uh, La Mesa, El Cajon, sure. right. I believe National City, and Chula Vista have them. So it's just something, uh, it, the, the expense is going to be, we should be able to absorb it, but it's, uh, it's something that I would like to look into. You know, I'm not trying to down the fire to fighters or anything like that. But no, I, I agree. I something we should look into for sure. I'd like, I'd actually love a report on that and, yeah. and bring that up at a future council meeting so we can discuss it and maybe work on that for the next, in, within the next budget. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've been talking about cameras for. Yeah, I know, I know. If, if, that's <laughs> why I'm, I know you're sympathetic. The trails, so, the roads, one thing, whatever. One thing, yeah, exactly. One thing, if you can go to El Cajon, though, set up uh, a meeting up in El Cajon and go see how they actually work. Do I have to? I sell them no, and try to go over there. No, well, I know. It's a tough area. It's, it's, it's in the police station, so it's safe sometimes. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ron. Laura? Okay, so this is, um, I mean, what was said at the top of the presentation is these are funds that we're ta discussing how it should be used for, like, one-time use. So when we talk about staffing, that's not one-time use. And um, that's, a, that's a cost that doesn't go away. And just looking at this year, yeah, it's 31% it's over above. Uh, it's at 31% in our, I mean, so we have this extra money. But last year it was 24%. I mean, this is the best year we've ever had. So and best year in 20 years. So it's not sustainable to fund positions with looking at the 20-year, you know, lens here. So that's why I did ask to have um, the council priorities. This is from the February 22nd, 2023 agenda item. What? Okay, so uh, council, Vice Mayor Trotter mentioned item one and two, or actually one and three of ten. So the first one is uh, focus on improvements for fire station facilities and services. And we did allocate a million dollars, which uh, the chief mentioned were, were short, you know, based on the RFP that came back, I'm sure. Um, and then we also have looked at uh, SLEMSA and getting additional funds through that and additional positions as well through that. So those are some, besides the funds that we put from our reserves, you know, our overages on our reserves towards those, that one priority or the first listed of the 10, we're, we're working towards that. Number two was considered annexation of West Hills Parkway and surrounding parcels. And, you know, in the scheme of things, that's a nice to have, but not a need to have. And I, I think based on the nods, we probably agree. Um, number three, continue to focus on expanded rove and paving and other infrastructure improvements. So it's not just roads and pavings, it's also the stormwater and all that other stuff, and, and, and we know that. Um, number four, expand and diversify economic development opportunities through the Arts and Entertainment District and cannabis implementation, so we're actively working on those. Um, number five, implement an automated permitting system and other managed information system enhancements, such as website redesign and a future financial software upgrade, which that is looming. And we've seen how long software imp implementations take. We need $900,000. I bet we'll need more. Uh, I, just, I just bet we'll need more. So, <laughs> well, that's just how it goes, right? So we would have to start pretty dang soon. Uh, number six, continue to focus on positive resolutions to homelessness and risk reduction, especially in the San Diego River Corridor. That ties to number one in, in a lot of ways, uh, or at least public safety overall. We've allocated significant dollars to um, the river bottom and, and, you know, creating barriers and paths for our firefighters to travel. And that's a one-time use that we still continue to need to do. Um, number eight, to Councilmember McNelson's point, enhance and implement safety and maintenance improvement on city's trails. Well, that's our trail system. We want to feel safe on our trails. We, we're, we haven't allocated money towards that, though. We, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done there. Number nine, it's always a good idea to, it's not, it's not sexy, but uh, CalPERS and the unfunded liability, whenever possible, you should always put money towards that. And then finally, number 10, which we're all on track and it looks like it's coming pretty soon, is the um, development impacts fee study. So I, I definitely think we need, um, I'm, I'm all for paving roads. 
Um, the community center was a top, top 10 priority in here, but when we did this meeting, that was funded to the best of our knowledge, and we were moving forward with it. So that's why it dropped off. Well, it seems like it's back on the table because we need more money, and I don't want to delay building this community center that we've been talking about since 2018, I think, um, maybe even 2016, because um, we might need an, an extra $1.5 million. It, it, it was a priority that dropped off because we thought it was handled, and we, we need that money. We have to get that going. We have to, I mean, we have our, our team. We're at almost 100% design. We should be ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, we should be ready to go on that. And if we need some more money to get that across the finish line, we need to do that. Um, so these are all priorities. Um, but some rise to the top of 900000 needs to happen. Community center needs to happen. It looks like we need to allocate more money for the temporary station. Um, I, I personally can't justify staffing when we don't have, this is supposed to be one-time use because we can't guarantee it every year. So I, I agree with most things except that one part. And add the community center. So I, I heard you agree with me? Part. That, that's all I heard. That's all I heard. <laughs> Typical man. Exactly. All right. So... I think these are all good ideas. If we had about, oh, let's say, $20 million in uh, over. <laughs> but uh, we don't have that kind of money, obviously. So as people listen to this and they hear us talking about all these different things, I would hope they think, man, I don't envy those folks up there because we'd like to do them all. I uh, agree with Laura, and one of the questions I was going to say is, so... Do we have the money to fund six additional um, fire staff members uh, from now and in the near future? Or will we have to take $6 million, this entire nearly $6 million, and budget for the next six years hoping that we get more money? And the reason why I say that is because when it runs out, you don't have the staffing. It's very much like some of the programs that we had here before where we hired uh, firefighters, and when the money ran out because the grant was over, uh, we had to let people go or hope that there was enough attrition that we were back to where the staffing was before. And um, and I agree with Laura. This is not full-time funding. This is one-time funding, and that's what we need to do. I don't. I, I, I give you the floor in just a moment, Rob. But if you if you have figured out a formula to do this uh, funding um, over the next who knows how many years. Um, I'm all ears because I'd love to see us have more firefighters because I know what the difference is between not having enough staffing in your emergency services and the consequences can be for that. I just I, I want somebody to enlighten me on how that can be done. So my point with this is, and I and I recall when we had the one-time funds and we lost them and we ended up, I, I recall when we had to do that, that was very difficult um, to do. However, we're adding stations where we, we need to have people in those stations. We have, I mean, we're adding stations. We have no choice, but we have, so we, we have to find this one way or another. <laughs> There's no way around that. We have to find this one way or another. This is just the kickstart. But isn't, isn't, st isn't the station over here, not here, by Santee Lakes, sorry. Station 5? Yes. Isn't that one already, like, beyond capacity? Don't they have, already have too many? Like, wasn't that part of the first plan is to build this temporary station by the operation yard and then actually relieve that station because it's beyond capacity right now? To an extent. Yeah, that is, that's included in the plan. As we obviously only have two stations, the uh, placement of our apparatus is not optimal, and so that is the the most immediate solution: is moving a unit from that location to the temporary station. And then we could. Add. And, and we still need to add over there, do we not? We still need firefighters, but I, I get it. I get it, and I'm not looking, you know, from from Fireside. We're not looking to rob Peter to pay Paul here. I'm not looking to 
completely undermine all the other needs in the city because that's what the cost would be as well. So I'm, I'm, I would like to acknowledge that, that um, we have a lot of hardworking people in this city and a lot of hardworking departments, and they have needs too. So I understand. I get it. We get it. My I, personal I think where, where we really benefit is, is over time. For instance, uh, finish the fire station, okay? Move the personnel that need to be moved. And in the meantime, though, we're going to have some other businesses coming online because we're talking about at least 18 months before we see any relief there. And in 18 months, we'll have other businesses come online. We'll be able to have another budget, a full budget cycle coming forward. And at that point, we can start working on how we're going to have that continuing continuing revenue service in order to fund those. Because I, I think we're going to be able to get there. I just don't think we're going to get there using one-time funds. So I, I get that. And, and I really do appreciate that thought. I really, really do. And I, I, there's no one here that knows, uh, you know, better than you probably do, my support for the firefighters. And... But I, we have a really tough decision here, and my Mr. decision. Mr. Mayor, I, at least my, my comment, it's not about the firefighters. It's about our city. It's about our constituents. It's providing the best service to our constituents that, that we should be providing to them. And this is an area that we have been lacking on is giving them the proper service that they, you know, require. The chief has talked so many times about response times. If we can't get to somebody in four minutes, and a lot of you guys heard, you know, a month ago when I had the gentleman here with the, with the uh, cardiac arrest here, we got to him. I was on that apparatus that day. We got to him and we saved his life. He walked back in this here because of our um, sheriff's department deputies and because of those firefighters. They got him back to the hospital, got surgery, and he walked back in this, this place a month ago. And that I, you know, that's what we all owe our citizens. We owe our citizens that opportunity every single time. And there's some, like I mentioned two weeks ago, I think it was, or whenever chief said, we got some real, real tough decisions to make here. And, and it all comes down to, again, priorities and, and all these things. And this is, it's not easy. And I'm, I'm not, I'm usually not the one advocating for, you know, more, more staff either. But I'm understanding where we are today within the, with the budget we have, the monies we have, and the opportunity that we have to, like Rob said, kickstart this and go forward with what we really need to, to do to provide for the city. Okay, I, I get that. Everything we do is about the constituents. Uh, the people that live in this community that we have to walk by every day and say hello to. And we don't want to have to hang our head. My question is, though, um, if we do this now, um, can we come up with a list of what community benefits we're also going to have to give up? No more concert series. Uh, do we give up the... Um, you know, our uh, Santee TV, which is getting great reviews for being transparency to the people who live in our city. Or do we give up, you know, the senior programs? I, I don't know. It, and I'm not trying to say this to be facetious or flippant. I'm just saying that in order to do that, um, you have to give up programs. How many people do we have to lay off in order to hire six, hire six more people? I don't know. These are just things that we need to consider. And, um, and uh, quite frankly, I'm not willing to consider letting people go. Um, I think we're going to get to where we want to be. We're just not going to get there well, in the next six to eight months. And keep in mind also that when you hire those trainees, um, they're a part of the equation on how much it costs. It's not just their uh, you know, wages once they become full-fledged firefighters, uh, and there's, there is a cost to that, and it's not, a, you know, insignificant cost. S yeah, exactly. And, um, but one time, these are one-time funds, absolutely one-time funds. Uh, so, but I do appreciate what you're saying. I, I get that, 100%. So, um I would like to also say, like, it, it does sound, though, we do have a shortfall in funding the temporary station. So, like, should, should that be one of the topics that we discuss with this fund? 
Uh, that was one of that was my number two was priority. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was number two or that was number. Three? Oh, th well, actually, I guess it was four. But if you're four. if you get rid of three, then okay, <laughs> then it becomes number three. Okay. So yeah, for me, the software, uh, community center, and the temporary fire station and roads. Did I miss you know anything? For, and I want to do something with the trails. I mean, I really do. I, you know, for me on this, I, I would switch that two and three. And the reason why I would say that is because uh, we have been working so hard on this other permitting software, and I think that a lot of staff is really just kind of getting used oh, to without it. Without a doubt. It was a joke about making about doing that, implementing <laughs> that this year. That was a joke. That, that yeah, was I mean, just it, to scare the heck out of the staff. Some now, of these things are, are <clears> just <throat> allocations. Well, scared the bejeebies out of me. Yeah, it's just no, allocations. Yeah, just allocations. When they're it. implemented, how they're implemented, Certainly not. You know, all that, that's the staff's yeah. job. <laughs> okay. Well, then number three wouldn't be a bad thing then. Yeah. But I think that uh, by um, getting that station online, getting the staffing moved, uh, first of all, that will be the first uh, fire facility we've had south of Mission Gorge Road. It could, uh, especially since that's going to probably be in the ambulance, maybe a, a truck of some kind, uh, probably would have a greater response time uh, south of Mission Gorge Road, and uh, and then we go for there. So for me, that is a priority. And, yeah, we can put, throw in some, you know, software money, I guess, but uh, it's not high on my list, Not not in this budget. And it's and it is a one time cost that we're going to have well, to have, and it's that. a million dollars. But if we put part of it towards that, then we, you know, next year we can fund it and fund it and fund it until we get there. The three year rule. So the th I'm just to recap. So the three things I suggested: two point nine million, nine hundred thousand dollars, and a million dollars. Still leaves a million point one point one million dollars still. I'm just on. I'm just using my thing. So, you know, that's a decision. Are we? Are we going to? Use these five point million dollars. We're going to save some of it. I mean, what, what are we? I mean, well, remember last year we this, put a, this million. is a lot of money, you guys. It adds up. This is not just a million dollars. A million and a half no, or two. I get it. This, like we've had in the past, where you know we only had a one or two things able to do this. This I, is a I, I, <laughs> chunk that we have a lot opportunity here to do a lot of things. I, I'm thinking put it more into roads. Well, I like I said, funding fully funding We're funding for goal. two years at that point, right, Carl? Yeah. Two Based more on the recommendation years. you gave, we would be funded for. This fiscal year coming up and the next one. Yes. What percentage would that take us to? Well, based on the payment <coughs> manager report, it's going to get us closer to that 70 PCI. That was the goal, and that's what was established in the report. We'll rerun the report in the next year or two, then we'll have a feeling where we actually fall. Because so, it's still just a plan. It's not yeah, right. that's exactly so, what's going to happen. So, how many, it, it was five five year plan, mm -hmm. and we've completed year two already. Is that correct? Yeah, 22, 20, 20. Yeah, so we did it in 22, right. so 23, 24. So we are funding year three and year four, potentially. Yeah. Then there will be the one fund. more year, but yeah. I right. think we might be recommending in another year to come back with another plan to, to get a better benchmark where we're at. We gave a heck of a kickstart we gave you guys to it's get It's the biggest going, kickstart right? we've ever had. I think Heather's right. got some work. Would you require another um, PCI test or survey? That's what we'd recommend, and we would build that into the program and, and reevaluate all the streets, and that'll help give us another indicator of how this money and extra infusion actually is getting us towards those goals. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that before or after, after uh, Padre Dam does our streets? <laughs> we'll, we'll wait till they're complete. Definitely be after. Yeah. Laura, do you want to clear anything after up? After at all. <laughs> well, when you were talking about software, what, were you, what software were you saying? The finance software. Yeah, the, the finance. finance software, the ERP You're saying software. yes to that. I'm yes. saying 100% okay. we okay. need to fund it. Like you know, sure. When fund it's implemented. It or, there was some joke going around about software. And I'm oh, like, no, the joke was, was that start tomorrow on it. Oh. You know, and no. Well, have, it, have it implemented this year. It's an allocation of funds. Okay, okay. He got me on it, okay? Okay. I fully <laughs> admit that. Okay. All right. Is that it? I think that's it. Council, are there any questions? Have, have like, you been Council, able to? Council, can I? Yeah. <laughs> Marlene has Mr. a few. Mr. Mayor, if I could ask for oh. just some clarification, we've had a number of thoughts brought up. On a staff level, what I'm hearing is this year and next year for roads, that's 2.9, 2. 2. right? So we're going to take care of that. 
And then I'm hearing to take care of the financial software. So that's, everybody seems to agree on that. So that yeah, puts us at three, basically 3.8, 3. right? Well, we because we already have 100,000, that's 900,000 plus 2.9, that's 3.8. That leaves you with roughly $2.1 million left that you have some disagreements on how to expend right. those dollars. If we could cut, at least cut down to two point, you know, to the 2.1 and you're in agreement on the balance, that gives us something to go after. And then we've heard a number of different things, putting money into the temp station. I will tell you that we had um, a good plan for our temporary fire station. We ran into some financial issues when we bid the project. We're going to be rejecting those bids and modifying our process for moving forward. Um, I'm going to kind of put Carl or Steve on the, on the, uh, the button here a little bit and see if there's a way, if council wanted to put money into a temporary fire station, because I'm also hearing that brought up a lot, if they put $500,000, do you think that's gonna get us there? Do we need 800? Understand we're not holding you to it, you know, your, your hands are not tied here, but in a general world, what would we be looking at to get through the bidding cycle and get the temp station going? It, it'll certainly help, I, I can't say definitively it'll get us there. I understand that. Um, we still need to look at some modifications to the potential plan that we brought forward, maybe reducing some of the infrastructure and things we planned on doing. And that's something we have not really got into the meat and bones of that conversation yet. Okay. So, Carl, I get you're the engineer who's sliding around the number. I get that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the other alternatives that are on the table, you had um, additional contribution to CalPERS was another suggestion. There was a suggestion for the community center. There was a suggestion for the temp station. Um, sure, the community center looks like 1.5. You could give some of that, all of it, none of it. CalPERS, you could give us any number. Um, I didn't hear anybody jump on that one, um, so it's not super sexy for you. For, for me, it's community center and temporary fire station of the remaining options. So if you tell us that, we'll try to take the balance of the money and make it work the best that we can for those two projects, if that's what council wants. We don't know what the we don't know what the real numbers are. No, so we I, can't I get that, but we decision. can uh, dedicate it to that, mm. and um, and if it's less, then it gets reallocated. Is, yeah, because we're that, sitting at a hundred percent design on the community center, so we have to move. Right. Uh, so what I was suggesting is that you take um, million, another million dollars and um, dedicate it to the. Uh, a fi temporary fire station, and um, that can be held, uh, and if we need less, we need less. Uh, the rest of it dedicated to the uh, community center, so we can move forward on that. That, that works for me. That works. I think, do we need to get to the community center? Do we need one and a half to get there? That's the number that I saw in the staff report. So... Yeah, the one the one point five would get us there. It will also um, potentially get us closer to to starting sooner. Okay, so council, what I what I would ask at this point to help I, resolve I the question that is, will you just take the balance of what you have and work on those two projects? Get the temp fire station moving forward, and if you want to do the community center, or assign some money to either of those, or give us another alternative is fine. Well, I, I'd say dedicate the money to the uh, community center, get it started, and what we have left over, go to the uh, fire station. I agree with that. Uh, is that a motion or? Uh, the well, I, can, we can, do this. can I interject on that one? We're going to know the temp station um, number first, and we maybe fund that first, and then whatever's left over. That that's fine. I mean, we still give that direction. Still lawful. Uh, still falls within, you know, the purview. Um, do you have any? Concerns? I'm fine with it. I mean, I, I still want to look at the software, but other than that, the, I mean. Uh, uh, Rob, do you have any? I'm just still frustrated that the number of the for the community center keeps going up every time I say, are you sure this time? And yeah, yeah I'm sure. And then it keeps it. going up again and again it. and again. So it's it's getting a little aggravating. I mean, we started off, this thing was $9 million. I mean, that's a ridiculous number now in, in retrospect because it didn't include the things that it was supposed to. And it was, you know, we're looking at different phases. It, it's, this is getting out of control. We're, and we're, at, we're, we're going to be at $24 million here soon. I mean, we're, we're $3 million short right now well, is what we're looking at. Yeah. 
It's, we're nowhere close. We, we can't fund the difference. It, even with a million dollars, it's not going to get there. It, it, there has to be this is just a something start. else has to change. This is, this is just enough start again to try to figure out how to fill a gap that it's, it's a hole. Until the next it's a much bigger year. hole than, than well, what we have. The, the thing is, though, that if we don't get started now, it's just going to continue to grow. Oh, I, I get that on the, on the overall cost, but the problem is we're not ready to start. Hey, Carl, I mean, please help me to tell me if we gave you guys a million and a half dollars today, you can't start this for another 18 months, right? Is that well, my yeah, understanding? The, the, the vast majority of the funding is coming from developer impact fees. Sure, I understand. Those, those are some of that money is well, let, not currently in the bank. Let's forget that we, that we need any. Let's say we can fund the whole entire thing today. Five million, ten. I don't care what it costs today. When could you actually start this thing if we could? Physically, you know, with our current workload and staffing, not till next spring at the earliest as right. recommended in We're the We're talking the 18 more months before we can even start the project. If we but, but we still the need money. the money. Well, we still need the money. And, oh. and yeah, I know that. we, you know, the whole bid process, and you know this, I mean, it's, yeah. it's going to take a while. And it's you put the money aside when you have it now when, we're, when we have this 31%, because like I said, last year, 24. You can't, this is what we're talking about, the surplus funds and, and the top 10 priorities. The, reason, the only reason the community center isn't on there is because we thought it was fully funded. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, I mean, this, this yeah. has been since twenty sixteen. I don't, I don't think we can walk away from it. Yes, I, I think we have to do it. I think we. We're, I, th- we're I think too far. In twenty sixteen, it was a, a can- it was a priority of the council. In twenty sixteen, we ran into COVID twenty twenty. We lost a couple years there. It became a real priority to this council three years ago. Again, that we took and we put real money into that thing. We we put money into the the design, the the funding, the every, we did everything that we thought we were doing to try to get this to the finish line. But what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing the is finish the finish line line's moves. not even <laughs> in our sight. Sure. Well, it's in, our, it's in our sight. We'll get there. Past Oceanside right now. No, so. <laughs> no. I mean, I understand it's frustrating. I totally do. Um, and that's why the $600,000 for the, you know, the, at the turf or synthetic turf is like, ah, because we could have used that money for this or, or something that we just listed. Um, and that's why we, you know, there has to be a better process with the reserve funds, too. Just a process. We don't have that. So, I mean, we've come full circle on it, but I've, I've shared so my top four. I'm lost. Where's our priorities now? <laughs> the right if you don't know still. what your priorities are, sir, <laughs> we've got other issues. Okay. <clears throat> So um, we talked about um, the the first one. What, remind me, what, what was the first one? Because the roads, the roads. Okay, two point nine million. Okay, two point nine million for roads, and then we talked about uh, the software. Nine hundred thousand right. for the ERP software. Right. Okay, so then that's going to leave us what I'm seeing as three and four. So, um, so uh, let's see the uh, fire temporary station. fire station, uh, and then the remainder for um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to make a uh, I'm going to make a, uh, I'm going to create a motion here, and I'm going to say that uh, we uh, give direction to staff that we apply 2.9 million to the roads, nine million uh, nine hundred thousand dollars of software. One point five million to the temporary fire station. I'm uh, one point five million to the temporary fire station, and the remainder to the. Um, pardon me. I think it was one point five to the community center, and the rest to the temporary fire station. Th- that that's right. Okay, clarify that. Uh, one point five million to the community center, and the remainder to the temporary fire station. I'll sec- I'll second it. Okay. And, Mayor, that includes staff's recommendation on all the other items. Correct. Correct. Yes, because we don't have a reserve fund policy. <laughs> all right. Please, let's please uh, prepare to vote. And please vote. Motion carries with four eyes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for all the input.
And that takes us to item number 10, which is a resolution supporting affordable housing and commitment to a collaboration between the city of Santee and the county of San Diego. Marlene. Thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, and members of the council. Um, let's go ahead and advance the slide, please. So just as background, um, the council is very well aware that the county of San Diego is a very large landowner within the city of Santee, our city limits. Uh, they feel that they have total authority over what types of development they want to do on those particular parcels and have done that um, with various types of facilities such as Las Colinas, uh, the new assessor's office, and the new um, animal shelter that they are currently planning north of Chubb. Uh, pardon me, south of Chubb and north of Riverview Parkway. However, the city and the county have been working to try to coordinate land use designations throughout the city on county-owned property, and particularly tonight we would like to talk about the property that is located on Magnolia Avenue. Um, the county is requesting a, uh, a resolution of support from the city of Santee for their land use plan that they'd like to move forward on those par properties. Next slide. So the slide that's in front of you is the county-owned property uh, along Magnolia Avenue. It's the site that is southwest of Riverview Parkway and Magnolia. The council knows it well. For the community, it is bounded by a Riverview Parkway, north of which will be the new animal shelter. On the west side is Las Colinas. South is the residential area along Park Avenue and uh, the Methodist Church. And to the east, there are residential uses. The plan that you see in front of you um, includes the historic barn. It says polo, but I know our historians here in town would say it's not polo. It's just the barn. Uh, so it does include that, and this plan does not eliminate that. In fact, it allows for an opportunity to make better use of that site. The site is the former home of the Edgemore Dairy, and the barn is there now and will continue to be there. The city has previously considered this parcel, the entire parcel, as part of an office and institutional use as part of the Riverview Office Park Plan and the Town Center Specific Plan. Recently, the city designated 17 acres of the site for affordable multifamily housing development with the northernmost portion, the green section that you see, set aside for park and open space uh, surrounding the, the barn that would remain. City representatives, uh, elected and staff, have been working with the county behind the scenes to gain support for the county utilizing the property in the method that works the best with our current general plan and our upcoming town center specific plan update. The county has requested a support from the city for the plan that's in front of you so that they could take this forward to the Board of Supervisors in the immediate future. County staff intend to present this so that it does coordinate with the city's plan and allows them to, hopefully in the near future, sell off some of the affordable housing sites to be able to assist the city and the county in meeting the RENA goals that are uh, applicable to both agencies. Uh, in regard to the other county use, there's no guarantee of what will go there. However, that is the general area, as council is aware, that the county had proposed putting a homeless shelter in years past. Uh, that currently is not on the plan for the County of San Diego. They also have recently made an adoption that tiny homes will not be allowed to be built within District 2, our current supervisorial district, unless uh, there's negotiations with the community and with our supervisor. So this other county use could be anything that is in the county's, what we call our CIP plan. Um, they call it by another name. But there is nothing for a sheriff station upgrade or remodel, sorry guys, uh, in the future plan. There's nothing for any other types of uses that we could see at this time except for potentially a future library three or four years out. Could that change? Absolutely. However, the county does desire to want to bring the balance of this property into coordination with the city's, again, current general plan and our updated um, town center specific plan, as you'll note, moving forward, this looks familiar to our city council and to many of you in the audience. So from that perspective, I would encourage council and staff is actually, um, if we want to go to the next slide, staff is going to actually recommend that council approve the resolution working with the county 
allow staff to continue to work with the county on that other county use parcel because if we don't adopt this, the county still has the ability to move forward with anything they want on those properties. If they are going to move forward with this type of a land use plan, it limits what they're going to do with their own property and makes it more coordinated with ours. Then we only have to worry about one smaller piece rather than the whole thing. So in that regard, um, I would recommend to the city council that we uh, go ahead and approve the resolution and you authorize me to send a copy of that over to the county to be presented to the Board of Supervisors. Happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. We have two speaker slips. The first speaker is Gary Strawn. Is AJ uh, one of the speakers? He is the next speaker, sir. Yeah, we'll, we'll have AJ come up first. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Staff. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Staff. Um, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to talk to this proposal because I believe it is missing a strong enough essential protection of a very unique Santee community asset. As proposed, it seems to me it leaves the Santee Historical Society barn at risk of being crowded out or even being torn down instead of becoming a vital community landmark, vibrant gathering place, and park-like gateway to the arts and entertainment plan. I believe currently the county lease leaves the society at risk of forced vac vacation, vacating the property in 60 days, according to the current lease. It also prevents the improvements to maintain a quality park area and the building. The upper floors could readily become a much needed community gathering center and entertainment place, while the lower floor would be a, quality, a much more quality historical preservation attraction. These are all because Santee does not have the management control of that area. I believe that if the council were to delay the approval of this until a suitable management agreement or property transfer over the 4.75 acres would give Santee City in perpetuity the, the, the ability to assure that it meets and aligns with our city citizenry's goals and plans. Um, I have a special connection with this. Our family, um, it, we've, we've been residents here for 46 years, but our family connection goes back to 1917 where Linda's grandfather drove the standard oil cart, uh, horse-drawn cart. Um, in fact, um, it was at the adjacent building that her grandfather saved the county uh, bull and cows by putting them up on um, bales of hay during the flood, and he lived off of cow milk for three days. Um, our, my grandkids are sixth generation Santee, and I really like the idea that in 2124, they look back, their grandchildren look back, and at this meeting, we were able to assure that that area was preserved for their benefit. Thank you. No further speakers other than Gary Strong. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Councilman, friends. Right? Um, I'm going to, uh, Gary Strawn, I'm a resident and I'm also representing the Santee Historical Society here tonight. And I want to trump AJ. My great grandfather moved here in 1913. So, <laughs> um, pending details, um, we're cautiously optimistic with this plan. We understand the need for subsidized housing, and we look forward to the city gaining control of the park area. With a more stable agreement, we would be in a position to work with you, obtaining private and state funds to maintain the barn and the, and the property around it. I'm confident you will do the right thing. I'm not so confident about the county. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, 
One thing that I want to say before we go into discussion is that uh, a lot of people ask the question about affordable homes, and uh, many people are under the impression that that is a uh, what they call high density um, affordable, or what do they call that high density low income housing, and that's not what affordable housing is. Uh, if you look around Santee, we have affordable housing projects here that you would never even know. Uh, many people that live in those places are it's the closest they could ever come to living in maybe a, at or at a country club uh, because they are done that well and they have those many amenities. In the past, we were able to control a lot of what happened on uh, the property at affordable housing. For instance, we could uh, cause the management of those properties to do things like financial literacy for the people that are living there, tutoring for the children that are there, and uh, a variety of different amenities could be placed there. And they've always been very good. And only that, but affordable housing is can be only temporary because it's based on income. So let's say you have a single parent and they're living there with their two children. They end up getting remarried and then uh, they want to bring in that uh, spouse. And now the spouse is working, so they both make too much money to live there. So it's a hand uh, up type of uh, living facility versus a hand out living facility. So they're really very, um, very good for neighbors and neighborhoods uh, that they go into. So having said that, I just, I, a lot of people are concerned about that word affordable housing. And so I just thought I would go ahead and uh, describe what affordable housing really is. So um, Ron, you have uh, some comments? Yeah. I brought this idea up in 2020 um, to Joel Anderson's office. Uh, we've been working on this for four years now, and uh, we're finally making progress. Um, my concern has always been, first of all, I want to see the barn where there's a park there. But I knew that there's going to have to be a give and take if we do this. So when I brought this plan up originally, and I, I've uh, given it to, I'll say, two and a half of the three uh, supervisors right now because one of them is no longer with us but um so they they're they've been aware of this for since literally 2020 um and when we did this the idea was that we we give up some affordable housing and we because we have to and we're required to and we need to come up with homes to do it but we ought we get a park out of it and that's what this deal does it gives us a park not as big as i wanted but it gives us some ability to do. Um, I'm a little concerned about the other other item, but it's hidden in the back next to the jail. So whatever they put in there, they're going to have to. Uh, they're, they've got a nice view of the jail right there to kind of remind them what what's going on. Um, so I, I will make a motion to approve this, but I think it's to um, our benefit to do it. I'm very concerned about what could go in there otherwise. And uh, we heard about the tiny homes which you kind of saw me flip out over when the time came uh, with it. Um, I'm concerned it could be worse than this, and the county, unless you have something in writing with them, they have no problem changing their mind, doing what they want. So we're definitely in approval of this, and I think it's going to be a good addition. So, so I am, you know, this is progress in the right direction with the county, and the fact that there is some park space here dedicated where the barn is, um, is, is what people in Santee want. Um, I just wonder, is there any, I mean, the county, I guess, owns the barn too, or how does that work? Yes. So the county owns the barn, and they probably couldn't care less about the barn, and Santee wants and loves the barn. Is there any kind of process to claim, you know, make it be a a true historical building that they can't tear down or there's no such there's no such thing by the way <laughs> okay i don't know so that's what i'm asking oh mm, okay uh, do you have an answer that for that got an answer for okay. the barn is on the historical register but that doesn't mean they couldn't condemn it or something else but but it's as protected as it can be um and i know it looks run down but it's physically in pretty good shape, but just... 
It's only run down looking because they won't let you do anything. Right, to right. Them. We can't do anything outside, and, and you know, we, we don't want to spend money on it if they can throw us out in two months. So, yeah. right. But okay. So, let's, but it, uh, it, it is on the register. Thank you. So I think, Council, just a couple of quick comments to move forward with the rest of your comments and to answer perhaps some of the concerns from our um, our great historical citizens here and our historical society. This is a step towards the city and the county negotiating on trying to look at what happens on the property on the north end, the, par the park area and the barn. That has to be a decision by this council and the county board of supervisors on what happens with that. This is just the first step in that process. It doesn't, it doesn't say we're going to take it over. It doesn't say we can't, but it gives us at least a property to talk about. Right now, their property lines don't even align with the plan that is currently on the schematic that we showed you. So this is just a way to get a step towards that, and then we can start talking about affordable housing and how that comes in and what sort of amenities that has, maybe how that ties into the barn, and maybe the county negotiates with us to be able to take over that property should the city be financially in the position to be able to handle that, right? Because that all comes with a cost as well. But this is just the first step. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then um, with these other parcels for attainable housing, um, I think of Weston, whose um, development standards or building standards do they have to follow? City of Santee's? Okay, that's good. That's actually a great thing. Okay. And then, um, you know, of course, that big orange blob, the other county use, five acres, is concerning. But overall, we're getting closer to what I think we were, we've been working for. You, you all have been working for for a long time. So um, I'll, second, I'll second the motion. Hey, Dustin. Yeah, maybe, can you go back to the map, please, for a second? A couple questions. About. So in our, in our town center plan, our center entertainment district, we have, we have a road going through there, right? Is that able to still happen with this park at, at the top? Yeah, I see the it's highlight. It says proposed access roads. This isn't, it's not a city street. You know, is that... Are we able, Carl? Can maybe you can? Are we able to put road through the through the park there, through the middle of it? Is there any issues with the or what we've already created with the arts and entertainment? It's in line with the arts and entertainment district proposal that will be coming forward to you as a full proposal at a later date. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. And then Sean, maybe you could help me understand the like Councilman Hall said. You know, we don't have anything in writing from the county, like saying you know we're. Yes, this is good that we can do this. We can't do this. It, it, like, what's the legal side of, of us agreeing to this? Like, are we committed to, to something? Are we saying, yeah, hey, we... It's just, it's <laughs> a, I mean, if you look at what you're saying, you're, you're saying, hey, we seem to be moving in the right direction. Let's keep going. It doesn't, it, there's no commitment. I mean, it, all these things have to be worked out over time. Nothing is binding with, with this. It's just, you know, it's an expression of, Hey, this seems to be aligning with what we're doing, and we like that. So, you know that that's your expression of support. It's it's, um, but it's clearly non-binding. I mean, you're 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 just moving together collaboratively, which is what the point of this exercise would be. Has this gone before the board of supervisors yet? No, oh. they're probably waiting on what we're going to do. Yeah. They're waiting for this, sir. Yes, <laughs> they'll 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 accept it. I'm, oh, I I don't have any doubt they'll accept it because they're getting all the benefit out of it. <laughs> they're they're trying to screw us and, and say take it. So I don't well, no doubt they're going to. Here, here's one advantage though is uh, the county's not going to build affordable housing. What they're going to do is they're going to um, sell it to a uh, somebody, and then once it's sold, it puts it in a whole different cat uh, category. That means that it has to uh, comply with everything that we have in our zoning. For um, for the city of Santee, so the um, county cannot have a precedence opinion or action over the property once it's sold. We we have also talked to two, again two and a half um, developers that have uh, um, come forward and been interested in already picking up the property. The other one was scheduled to come in and talk to me, but they backed out the last minute. But so, so these these parcel lines, these are, are proposed new parcels, new new APNs. Is that fair? 
Okay, it's got four, four new parcels here. This open space park one, that's something to be negotiated in the future with the city. Who, how about that, who's gonna run it, who, what it looks like, county park, city park, whatever. Is that fair? Okay. I, I'm just having a real heartache with the county actually doing what they say they're gonna do. It, it's, it, Mr. Chavez, let me ask you a question. I got, I, we, um, we went into agreement with the, with the county for a grant with, to, to clear our river you know, homeless encampments like that. Has the county cleaned a single, a single encampment since that we went in that agreement with them a year ago? Yes, they have started the Templeman cleanups. That is correct, sir. Okay. That makes me feel a little better. Okay. I, I don't know. Rob? <clears throat> Uh, I've got a lot of consternation over this, and that was the reason I talked to uh, Sean about it earlier with regards to actually what count, or Vice Mayor Trotter just, uh, just stated or just questioned as, as to what, what is our, what's our liability on this? What, it, what are we really tying ourselves to? And the reality is it's very little more than what's already out there, if anything more. Uh, it is just another step forward. I got to tell you guys, though, I, this <laughs> ominous other county use blob, that's not a, that's not an accident. That's not an accident. That's that's other county use is there for a reason, and that's well, what's got me worried about this whole darn thing. Is that spot right there? My concern is that whole parcel could be other county use. Correct. Right now. That's the that's and that's my biggest concern, and and that's been the concern from day one. That's why in twenty twenty, I started this whole process. Well, this will be. This will be a fight of fights if and when they decide to try and do some homeless shelter or something of that nature on the other county use site. That's but now the just, whole site I'm is, telling you now. I know, I agree. But so I did actually write a note that said track this for that particular right now. They, they know they, we, they there's no way they don't know what they want to do. They're tracking it too, so it's not a surprise like it was last time. Right now, they well, apparently it, it wasn't a surprise to some surprise. of us last they time. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they sent a letter to us months before that. They, they knew exactly it what they were doing. It was a surprise to me, but not apparently to others. So uh, that's why I'm saying this is not something that I, I, they, they absolutely know what they want to use this for. Um, it doesn't say no now, however, doesn't, it doesn't help anything. Saying yes doesn't hurt anything. I'll, I'll play nice right now. But guys, mark my words, man, they know exactly what they're going to do with that piece of land. I find land. it hard to believe you would have an opinion on it. Yeah. They, are, they, have, they have every intention of doing something there. They just don't want to say it right now because they want us to play nice. So I would track it very closely. Yeah, that's, it, it should be staff tracking this closely and keeping us informed. So and actually need... keeping all of us informed. Yes, yes that yeah, would be nice. Sure. My, my biggest concern is and uh, as we go through any kind of negotiation on this, is that we do everything we can to get that um, parklands um, in our titled in our name, and um, you know, uh, and then that way we can. And, and if we can even make the barn part of that land agreement, uh, even better, because you know what? Then that way we could start working together on getting that place where we want it to be. Uh, you know, you don't you don't have to worry about. Uh, where people are going to park, how they're going to make ingress, egress, where's the emergency exit. Uh, all those things can be worked out, and uh, we will have a top-notch, you know, park, park-like park area where people can go park, go to the museum. People can go when there's a special event there, know they're going to park someplace, and not have to wonder if they're parking, for instance, in, you know, Go for holes or not, or and I, over something. I agree with you wholeheartedly up and until the point where they say you can do that if we put a homeless shelter but, right here. Th see, that's just it. I am not going to give up on that's that's not that's not something I'm going to con no, concede I, on. No, I, I get that, and I'm not even suggesting that we oh, even okay. think about that. All right, I'm just saying we have to, you know, make sure that we whatever we do there, we negotiate the highest best use for it. And uh, in my con opinion. That is a highest best use is that well you know park area. Didn't we classify that as affordable housing anyway? Um, so council member, the the open space park, the affordable housing number one and affordable housing number two are consistent with 
our town center specific plan update that's moving forward with the arts and entertainment right. neighborhood. The other county use, the land is consistent, but the use is not. We right. would definitely right. prefer if that was also listed as affordable housing to be consistent with our housing element. But we At this point, it, anything they do there could be whatever they want. And so this is, again, it's just a step. Right. Uh, but we that's, did that's that. A, we did as didn't we come through and and make the our classification as that? Yes, sir. The, so the to, city council has already right. said yes. This works with the center road. You already looked at that. Right. Those were elements that city council's approved. So that uh, that parcel that says other county use. So do we have arena allocation for that within our numbers? So if you recall, we did an overcapacity when we established our affordable housing yeah, rezones. So we're, we're reducing the number, though, by, by not having that as an affordable. Which is why we rent. will continue to work with the county to see if we can get them to affordable right. housing. And as well with the other units that are moving forward on other properties who would rather do non-affordable. Just same, because they process. have it as other county use doesn't change our zoning on it, though. That's what I've been trying to say. No, but it, the use could be different. Than what we, right. So it, it, they could choose to do something different. However, it doesn't change our zoning on it. Right. Yeah. So that, hate to say it like this, but that's another bridge to cross when we get to it, unfortunately. And uh, we will do, uh, well, another five years we'll do RAINA again or six years, something like that. I forget. So. Okay, I, I have a motion and I have a second on that. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Speaker slips? No. All right, oh. no speaker slips on non agenda public comment. City Council reports. I'm going to let Laura talk about her uh, transfer of care. Laura. <laughs> you, 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 I want to start down to the other end while you look. I'm just going to make this comment about, so we, we attended the transfer of care um, meeting yesterday, which is basically talking about the offload times from when the ambulance sits on the wall, and this is just specifically for Grossmont Hospital, but hospitals in general are seeing a, a definite surge in their emergency rooms, and so therefore the push is that offload times take longer, although Grossmont Hospital, once again, is doing better than others around the county. Okay. And um, the county provided some data, and I just, and Andy Parr was sitting next to me yesterday, so I was just like, is this true? Just crazy to me. Um, it was some metrics. Sorry, I wasn't ready. Um, basically, I, I think it showed, like, in January, there were 189. Um, uh, it, this was, it was a 100-day look. So they picked, you know, I picked a day in January where, where it was a peak, and it was 189 issues or, or ad, people admitted with something related to influenza. So it could have been the flu, it could have been COVID, it could have been anything that. But then the next highest peak for that same day or within those days what it, it is um, related to some kind of substance, substance abuse. And, and I said, and so it was like 189, and then the next one was 119 <coughs> of substance abuse, substance abuse issues. And, and then everything else was much further below on that, and I just thought, Wow, we're, you know, the hospitals are overwhelmed. The emergency rooms are overwhelmed. They literally don't have the space to put people. They're just, you know, beyond capacity. And um, so I asked, I said, well, how long has this been going on? Is this like a me 10 year trend, 20 year trend, three, three year trend? So, you know, obviously name fentanyl, but the fact that this is a three year trend, I don't see it going away unless something really changes, you know. It, it just, I just was, it was so eye-opening. It's a very valuable meeting to attend. I, I like, you know, hearing what they have to say. You, you might think it's one thing, but then to see the data, you're like, wow, it's crazy. That's it. Maybe we should show them the formula for building emergency uh, emergency rooms. Well, they've they've changed emergency rooms a little bit, so they've actually made it 
the doctor comes out and sees the person now versus, you know, running them through the system and then later on. So it's actually a better, it's a little bit faster at Grossmont, and that's the advantage of doing it. I don't know if the chief has any comments he'd like to make. Yeah, Grossmont's a, uh, they're doing the best they can. They're the busiest hospital in the county, but they're actually, their numbers compared to county averages are, are better in a lot of areas. So we have a great relationship with them. They're doing the best that they can with, um, again, all these very complex variables that they're faced with. So there, there is a lot of value in the meetings, without a doubt. There's about 20 of us that are there on a given day, and uh, maybe even a little more. And um, every fire department's there, and uh, Grossmont uh, takes it very seriously, and they're, they're uh, done it. Uh, my wife's there with me, that's on the Grossmont Healthcare Board, and the guy that runs it, uh, the CEO, Christian Wallace, actually was the one that um, put it all together for us. So. Is that it? It's interesting. Yeah, that's it. Dustin, anything? Just a quick announcement. Next Wednesday night, we'll have the uh, District 4 Town Hall right here at uh, City Hall. We'll be uh, presenting on, obviously, not only District 4, but the whole entire city. Things are going on here, so if you guys can join us here. Otherwise, you can watch us on Santee TV, just like tonight. Thank you. You don't do that? No, that's something different. That is for tomorrow, next week, but he won't be here, so. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Nothing, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Okay, uh, just to let you know, I did not attend the uh, Cal City's Board of Directors meeting uh, last week. I was not uh, in a position to uh, take seven hours flying to uh, Fresno and then driving another 90 minutes to Yosemite just to come back two days later. Um, I know crazy, crazy stuff going on. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, Sandag wasn't anything really significant that went on there. Um, well, it's kind of early in the year yet, so stand by to stand by. Yeah. City manager? Nothing tonight, sir. City attorney? No report. Okay, great. Thank you. That's going to take us to a closed session. And, w you know, what I'd like to do is uh, take, um, dun -dun -dun -dun. Yeah, we'll just take them in the order they're at. I was thinking it was the other way around for a second. Thanks for everybody that's hung in there with us all evening.
All right, let the, let the record reflect that we're back in uh, open session. We had uh, item number 11, conference with legal counsel, no action taken, nothing to report. Uh, item number 12, public employee performance evaluation, action taken, direction given to staff to bring back for open session. And that concludes our meeting. Adjourned.